And I think you're muted. Okay. I welcome you to the ongoing Fellowship National Certificate. This is the Fellowship National Certificate uh, for mediators in Kenya. And uh, as an ongoing program, this is a program that has been going on for the last uh, five months uh, and uh, started off in, Ju in July and uh, running on uh, until November, which is the fifth month of the Fellowship National Certificate. We are delighted that uh, today our fellows will deliver the inaugural Ignatian uh, lecture on conflict transformation. This lecture is in celebration of the gift of our first fellowship director, Reverend uh, Professor Father Peter Ignatius Gishure, who gifted us the opportunity for this fellowship and just the context of conflict transformation in mediation. Today is on the 20th day of the month of November in the year 2021. With that, I will start off with the words of the Kenyan National Anthem. Today, we have with us Dr. Sharon Sutherland, who is from Mediate BC in Canada. Dr. Sharon Sutherland is the fellowship co-director for the ongoing uh, fellowship. And we thank her for her, her dedication, her diligence, and just the delight she brings to the mediation community as we have pursued this particular program. We also have with us uh, our fellowship uh, coach, Coach Maina Azimio. Coach Maina Azimio has journeyed with the fellows in uh, the wellness component of this program. The fellowship program is designed to be able to support fellows in their wellness as a virtual uh, personal development course. The focus is on wellness and we thank Coach Minor as we also thank all the other coaches who have journeyed with the fellows in this particular program. We will have a brief presentation as part of integration from Coach Minor, and then we will be able to proceed on with the presentations by the fellows. With that, allow me to uh, start off with the words of the Kenyan National Anthem, Wimbo wa Taifa. We will have the third stanza of the Kenyan National Anthem. Natujenge taifa letu, endio wajibu wetu, Kenya istahili heshima, tungane mikono, pamoja kazini, kila siku tuwe na shukrani. In English, let all with one accord, in common bond united, build this our nation together. And the glory of Kenya, the fruit of our labor, fill every heart with thanksgiving. Today is truly a wonderful day for us to give thanksgiving for this great journey. We commend, congratulate, and acknowledge all the participants in this program as we also crown the fellows who will conclude and deliver the inaugural Ignatian lecture. With that, kindly allow me to invite Coach Maina Azimio as he, give us, as he gives us the integration on the wellness component, the five months journey that the fellows have been able to have during the fellowship. Coach Maina Azimio, how are you today? I'm fine, thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a good morning, and as we have said, is fill every heart with thanksgiving. I think today is really just a crowning day, and we are delighted that we have your segment to help us just crown this fellowship as we are concluding. So, Coach Maina, over to you for your brief uh, integration. Asante Sana. Thank you very much. Is, is it also good morning with Sharon? Sharon, is it morning? <laughs> No, no, it's uh, it's almost midnight. We're it's eleven seventeen, I guess here. So no, oh. not morning. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so, Karibu sana, everyone. And uh, today, yes, uh, we are honored to have gone through this process from day one up to now. Uh, God has been very kind to us. Uh, we remember our brother, uh, Professor Gishure. Uh, with a lot of uh, respect. Many things have happened and uh, everything that happens, God is in control. 
I would want to just take us through just a recap of uh, what we have covered in uh, this process. As I had said earlier on, uh, at least I will not introduce myself because I have been introducing myself over the last four sessions. I'm still the same person. I'm a wellness coach. I am a mediator. I am a business consultant and I am a corporate trainer and I do conference speaking. So these are the businesses that I have, I'm doing currently. I'm running nine businesses and one foundation, our charity arm. The, the experiences that I have got into running these businesses is what I share. I'm an experiential trainer. I walked the journey of uh, health, reducing my weight from 98 kgs to my BMI 10 years ago now, and have sustained that journey over that time. So I share that experience as well. The reason why I got into the wellness space is because I realized our people are getting sick and depleting all their resources, trying to regain health. And it is not easy. It's better to prevent than to treat. So I became a mediator so that I can be able to get people to understand themselves and how to relate with other people. And you have covered that. We began our, Nini, we began our talks in this segment with uh, health wellness, the physical health, because that is where it all began. God made Adam, then gave him Eve. From all the research that I have done personally is that uh, the human DNA has never changed. The way God created Adam, those who believe in the Bible story, the evolution one is not very different. Uh, we have evolved, but the first man created by God in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, and then the other one who was uh, made from the soil of the ground in Genesis 2, 7, we have evolved from that level. The only thing that has been changing is our structure and how we do life. So all human beings created in God's image and likeness, and that is what informs our daily activity. Truth is that no person is born superior or inferior. The equality of human beings is not in doubt. What you do with your life determines your latitude. And that's where we get into. If you look at this, you'll see the ages, how people are living that time. Adam lived for, one, for nine, 930 years. Uh, we go all the way to Noah, 950 years. And one guy who was called Madhusela lived for 969 years. So the question is, what happened that our lifespan dropped from 900 plus to what we have today. And it's clear, the dividing line is uh, Noah's flood. After Noah's flood, our life longevity went on a free fall. Abraham lived for 176 years and Moses died at 120 years. But then in the Bible, I see God said in Genesis 6, 3, that our life will be 120 years. And that's where we are. Around the Guinness Book of World Record has records that indicates people living between 117 years and 121 years. So that verse in the Bible, Genesis 6, 3, it is where we rotate from. So from where I come from in Kenya, and I would like to tell Sharon that in our country, people are living half that age, uh, between 60 and 70 years. That is most, especially the middle class. That's where we live. Personally, I decided to champion life longevity. Life longevity. We have some people, especially the politicians, the rich people in Kenya, they are living to be 100 plus years. And one of our, our patriarch called Sir Charles Jonjo is one or two now. So that's a very good example. In America, I see the mother of McCain. She's one or eight years and she's in robust health. Queen Elizabeth is still in office and she's 95 years. So when you die at 70, what a waste. And what can we do to ensure 
life longevity for the majority of the people. So that is why I'm very passionate about wellness and I help people to live to the age of Moses 120 and to Genesis 6.3. That is my focus. So what is uh, cutting off our life is where I began. Uh, allow me to say this as we continue. I do not focus on the business side, whatever I'm training, I focus on you, the person, because you are the most important factor. So what I do is that uh, when I'm doing corporate trainings, I help the company to take care of their staff so that they can take care of the business. And the business will take care of the investors. So people are the investors, people are the customers, and the workers are people. So if you take care of the people, everything else <coughs> will fall into place. So these are the major things that are bringing us down. Unhealthy lifestyle, inactivity, especially now that we have gone to Zoom. I don't like this Zoom because you are seated most of the time. We are inactive. So unless you are very, very deliberate, this is not good. And it's not just Zoom, even we had started doing our work on a workstation seated, not studying. When I'm training and I'm on live stage, I walk around the stage. But now here I have to sit down. I'm actually seated now. So I'm training seated. We have not got the systems that you can be able to do it when you're standing. We I hope we'll get there. So we don't sleep enough. Again, we are denying our body enough rest. Poor diet. Do we even know what is good diet? We are looking too much into the commercial advertisements to choose what to eat. And they do it for their own interest, not you. So if you are going to choose what you're eating from the media, you are going to get yourself down. We discuss at length what you're supposed to do and how to choose in our first lesson. Poor hydration, water is very important and the role of water in the body. Also, what quality of water do you go for? The minerals which are put on, this, on the bottle of water, mineral water, do you know what they mean? Uh, those minerals, how do they interact with your body? How do you choose? Because life is choice and not chance. Being broke, this was now our lesson number three, financial wellness, because all these things, whatever you want to do, if you don't have money, it is wishful thinking. And by the way, it gives you more stress when you do not have money to afford what you require to be able to give you good living. And that's why in Kenya, the people who are living many years, they also have resources. There is a relationship, even the World Health Organization has linked it very well between life longevity and financial wellness. And that's why we, after we do health, we do mental because the mind choose what you're going to do, then we do financial. So being broke is one of the things that is bringing people down and lack of self-care. You can't take care of yourself without money. So all this now leads to stress. And when stress is not managed, it will morph to depression. Cases of depression have increased a hundredfold, especially in Kenya. We are not doing good in this space. And even the world over, especially now after COVID, it is a big concern and most people are going down. So what will we do? What are the causes? First and foremost, I normally advocate for self-discovery. We're talking of personal development. We are talking of giving people CPD for points. But what is this development? What are you developing? Please don't begin to develop what you don't know. Start with discovery, self-discovery. You do not create yourself. You discover you. Because the maker who sent you this way had a mission for you. And he gave you all what you require to grow, to become the best version of yourself. And remember, we are made in God's image and likeness. Discover yourself before you start personal development. You have all what you need to become the best you, but it is in raw form. When it is in raw form, you develop it so that it can be able to get you to where you're going. Then actualize, you master it, 
then you actualize your life. So how do you do this? In Azima, what we do is that uh, we have taken, uh, in 2015, the world moved from MDGs to SDGs. SDGs came in with a goal number three, which is wellness. And in wellness, there are eight dimensions. We focus on four of the foundational dimensions of wellness, which is physical health, mental health, financial health, and emotional health. If you can be able to master those, you'll be able now to develop you to become the best version of you so that you can serve humanity in a better way. We all exist to be, to be of service. So preventive health is the better option because most people don't have the money. And of the, the eight dimensions, the other dimensions are spiritual wellness. Spirituality is very important. Environment, that one we have got to do. We had just finished COP26 two weeks ago. Career development is also very important. And social, we are social animals. We need some sociological wellness. And here is the aspirational needs from the psychological, physiological needs. We come to the safety needs. We come to the love and belonging. We come to self-esteem and then self-actualization. So a mediator must first take care of themselves so that they are able to take care of the people who are having conflicts or blips or at whatever level that uh, you're invited to be able to mediate between two parties who are having a problem. So our role in the planet on planet Earth is to support life. And as mediators, we look at what is causing blips and what is causing people to get into depression. When you have got problems with your neighbors, you have problem with your family members, you have problem at workplace, or anywhere else that societies are meeting, it will affect you. And that's where mediation comes in. And it is a better system because it is not like the court where the winner takes all. Or in the political leadership, where you go in the campaign and after voting, whoever win, he takes everything. In mediation, we transform those situation to a win-win for all. This is anchored in the wellness economy and the wellness economy in 2017 had 4.2 trillion US dollars, 4.2 trillion. So if you are able to take care of the human life and how people should live, this is there for you. So the financial wellness I talk about, it is not a far-fetched dream. It is just by taking care of the person. And these are the divisions that the wellness global economy has divided this space. If you look at all of them, it's all about taking care of the human person. Personally, I focus more on the workplace wellness. And I also focus on uh, anti-aging. There's over a trillion in anti-aging, fitness and mind and body, and healthy eating. We have done all that. So as for now, mediators as peacemakers, our role is to support realization of a long life in radiant health. The blips and conflicts that create negative energy, which is destructive requires our input. We have to sharpen ourselves so that we can be able to get this happening. So I want to ask, uh, uh, Wangari to read for me uh, this flyer. Wangari, read for me this flyer. Okay. Um, 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 uh, yes. Uh, hello, Coach Maina. And uh, as I read the flyer, is this the flyer that says mediators are peacemakers? No, no, no. The, 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 the flyer. The one I've read, the flyer, the one on the left. We did. Oh, ah, ah okay. We did not come to this world just to pay bills and die. We need to live. That is a quote from Mina. We did not yes. come to this world just to pay bills and die. We need to live. A quote from Mina, and I believe that is Coach Mina Azimio. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, that's me, and uh, that is my policy. That is my approach to life. And that's what I preach, that uh, we have much more. 
that we need to do in this world. And that's when I work for a legacy. I want to invite all mediators to think about this and then ask yourself, apart from paying bills, rent, you pay, like, you pay education uh, for your children, you get sick, you pay hospital bills, and you're paying bills everywhere. What else do you do? What will be remembered about you when you exit planet Earth? That will connect you to your true self. And when you get that connection, you will now start doing things in a better way. And that is what we li I live to do. I do not, I normally say that uh, life requires you to make your mark, to make your own mark in life. So we have got a blank cloth. We come with a blank cloth, color it, and forget about the rules that you are given on how to do it. Color outside. Do it in your own way. Those people who go out to make their own niche are the ones who get remembered, not those who play by the rules. Life is very timid when you play by the rules. So do it in a different way, and you will become a better you. So thank you very much. Uh, that is what we have covered this time. And with the four pillars that I have been covering, if you work around them and you do your mediation and you get into people in the right way, you will be able to get your mark in this society because the blips and conflicts are increasing and the calling is on us mediators. How can we bring people in and if you take good care of yourself and you're in good health, you will be able to bring the other people on board and you become a useful member. Thank you very much. Back to you, Agari. I acknowledge you and I thank you, Coach Miner, for your integration weekend remarks uh, on uh, wellness, where you have enabled us to integrate physical wellness, uh, emotional wellness, the financial wellness, and also mental uh, wellness or um, health, uh, mental health, physical health, emotional health, and financial health as part of our wellness uh, program. In addition, I wish to acknowledge you for your dedication to this program. It was a great delight and continues to be a great delight for the mediation community to engage and interact with you as one of the colleagues in mediation who has stepped up and stepped out and decided to color the world with mediation in your own way in the context of wellness. We acknowledge you, Coach Maina, we thank you, and we are delighted that you have been part of this very exciting journey. You have reminded us that the wellness um, economy is over a trillion shillings. And in essence, it means that mediators have the opportunity and are actually players in the one trillion shilling economy that is wellness, because we are peacemakers. You have challenged us to look at how we can support people to have a long life, but most of all in radiant health. Radiant health comes when people, when societies, when nations are able to have their act together. When they have disputes, as you like to call them blips, the mediators are there to enable them to get back on track and towards what they are a stand for. Again, colleagues and friends, I remind you, we did not come to this world just to pay bills and die. We need to live. That is a quote from Coach Maina Azimio, who has journeyed with our fellows through the five months program in the personal development course for mediators, which is focused on wellness. Coach Maina Azimio, Asante Sana. With that, we now move to the next segment of our program today. And the next segment is actually, uh, Coach Maina gave us a very good way to get into the uh, next segment. Life requires you to make a mark, color the world with mediation in your own way. And that is where we are starting off um, today. Colleagues, you have access to the fellowship binder for this uh, particular program. The fellowship binder has the list of the fellows who will be making presentations. 
these are fellows who have presented their uh, fellowship articles. We had two levels of articles, the blog um, style written article, which was 500 words. And the second article was the, the feature article, which was 1000 to 1200 words. And this is towards the journey of completing the ongoing fellowship program for mediators. And for those who have achieved the feature article, it gives you an opportunity to, to opt in the journal preparation or publication journey to which we will be working with our fellowship guide. And that is uh, Reverend uh, Dr. Peter Mbaro, who is the director at the Center for Social Justice and Ethics at the Catholic University of Eastern Africa. And so we are really looking forward that we will have more and more fellows in the years to come who will make a mark in this country. To the delight of the fellows who have uh, submitted their publications, uh, this is to let you know that um, the publications that are in the feature articles will be compiled and published under the title of Mediator Chronicles. The Mediator Chronicles, a chronicle is, uh, it, it, it allows like year to year being able to know or in a period, in a period to period, to be able to know who existed. So the Mediator Chronicles is you announcing that I was a mediator in Kenya. When it is 100 years down the road, they will have the Mediator Chronicle uh, for the year 2021, and they will find your publication there. So that is you coloring the world with mediation in your own way. And to that, this is the point where we now uh, will invite the fellows to be able to make um, their presentation. Uh, Dr. Sharon Sutherland, who is uh, the fellowship co-director, um, as I mentioned earlier, is with us and will be, will be supporting us with um, enhancing the presentations that we have made. By enhancing the presentations, uh, Dr. Sharon Sutherland will enable us to be able to beef up the uh, presentations that we have and also the documents that we have. And with, after that, we have one week to be able to do any changes or any amendments to them. And then we can submit for publication in the Mediator Chronicles as feature articles. So Dr. Sharon Sutherland, we are now ready to be able to proceed. And uh, if uh, it is okay with you, we will then be able to invite the fellows to be able to start making their presentation. That, Dr. Sharon Sutherland, that's okay with you? That is okay with me. I'm very much looking forward to hearing from folks and hearing your presentations. Okay. Asante sana. So with that, um, I will refer colleagues to the fellowship binder that, um, that, that we, we have. Um, and uh, the fellowship binder has um, the articles, that, uh, the, the, the list of topics. And uh, we will start off with the feature written article submissions. And uh, we will uh, uh, journey down uh, the list and call out the colleagues who are, um, um, on, who are uh, going to be able to make their presentations. So the uh, first article that we have, um, and um, I will read a number of the colleagues' names, or I'll say out a number of the colleagues' names, um, five of them, so that you can, be, you can prepare. Um, so we will be starting off with uh, mediator Margaret Gidae, and then moving on to uh, uh, Debbie Gishuki. Uh, Debbie Gishuki, we will have you as the, uh, as the 10th person. Uh, then we will move to, uh, so after mediator Margaret Gidai, we will move to Isaiah Kiplagat Meli, and then um, Steve Mutinda uh, Musembwa, then Pascalia Mainge, and uh, Mini Mangeli. Those are the uh, five to be able to, uh, uh, to, 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 to start us off. So with that, um, that means uh, mediator uh, Margaret Gidai, mediator Margaret Gidai, Mediator Margaret Gidai. Looks like you're just not unmuted yet. Okay. Uh, yes. There. Thank you. Okay. Yes, um, as, a, as a reminder, um, uh, Mediator Margaret Gidai, just before you start, yes, as a reminder, kindly. Uh, when uh, your name is called, please go on, uh, go on video or so that you're on broadcast and we can be able to have you unmuted in case it's an issue. 
So Karibu sana Mediator Margaret Gizai. And uh, so Mediator Margaret Gizai, your topic is, um, Mediator Margaret Gizai, her topic is on mediation in adolescent guardian relations conflicts. Welcome Mediator Margaret Gizai. Thank you so much and good morning to everybody. I hope I'm audible. Um, my yes. topic is adolescence, guardian parents, conflicts. And I start off. Conflict is a situation where two parties disagree on an issue or issues. This could be as a result of differences in values, beliefs, goals, communication, etc. Conflict is not always negative. Rather, it is the normal process through which people air and resolve differences and mend broken relationships. It's a process which can bring long-term better understanding between differing parties. However, if not handled correctly, it can destroy relationships permanently and create animosity which could lead to harmful actions. This could happen if the issues are not addressed before they become arguments which then escalate to conflicts. Adolescence is the age where people search for identity and are in a state of confusion or dilution. It is a state when independence and parental influence clash since the adolescents are able to think on their own, although they're still living under their parents or guardians. The adolescent has heightened internal conflict, which they more often than not express physically, especially on those around them, specifically the family. These conflicts are not gender biased, but happen to both boys and girls. Adolescents face many stressors, which could also be stressors to their parents or guardians. They face a lot of confusion as they cannot understand their physical changes, emotions, or even feelings. On the other hand, the guardian is out earning a living for the family and having little time for the growing children. Communication is minimal and the adolescent feels abandoned and unloved. As the adolescents gain an increased capacity for low for logical reasoning, they no longer accept things as they used to when they were younger, but rather question and demand explanations for them, which creates chances for arguments and conflicts. They say you don't, you, you don't understand, they will usually say to their guardian or superior. The guardian is left wondering, what don't I understand? Did I not go through adolescence also? This leads to the guardians perceiving their children as rebellious and hard headed. It leads to conflicts because none understands the other. The adolescent wants to have his way while the guardian expects obedience without questions. If this conflict is not well handled, it could lead to aggression or violence. It could also lead to the adolescent turning to other sources whom they believe will listen and understand them. When this happens, then it is time to get help to ensure the young adult does not veer off into practices that could be harmful or destructive. Unfortunately, it's rarely the services of a mediator are sought. Instead, the child is usually sent to a counselor alone without the guardian. This does not help mend or heal the relationship. It may even create a greater rift between the two parties. The guardian is too busy trying to earn a living for their family, both nuclear and extended, as is more often than not in our family setups. It happens that when the children get to the age of seeking for self-identity, usually 12 years, that guardians or parents relax in following up on them. The children now start doing homework on their own. They start having more alone time than before, they are allowed more freedom with friends or peers than before. The child may see this as a lack of interest in them by their guardian. The warmth and affection they had been receiving before has reduced it drastically and they feel left floating in a world they do not understand with no one to reach out to at home as they used to. They then find comfort in their peers who are usually equally lost and confused. At this stage, they may start experimenting with various things, including drugs, alcohol, sex, etc. 
this only leads to the child guardian relationship becoming distant. Communicating it's in the guardian or parents, even in their tight schedules, and even as they want their children to have freedom, should strive for both quality and regular time with their children as much as possible. This will reduce or avert suspicious misunderstandings, which could lead to conflict. Parents or guardians should try to be friends with their growing children to create an enabling atmosphere for them to have healthy relationships. However, as this is not always the case and conflicts are being experienced, it therefore calls for a third neutral party to come in and help the two communicate and come to an understanding. The mediator, the sober and impartial party sits with the two disputants, giving each an opportunity to express their concerns and views and facilitates in reaching an understanding on how to communicate with each other and how to avert any further misunderstanding and conflict. On the other hand, guardians or parents also face their own life stressors, which could affect relationships with their children, the demands of parenthood, jobs or businesses, family life, social life, and even the biological face they may be at at the moment. Guardians or parents may be overwhelmed by the demands of life. And when they get to their homes are looking forward to rest in a peaceful environment. However, when they get home, they are likely to face challenges and conflicts with their own children, spouses, or those living under the same roof. All these are factors that could fuel or worsen their relationships. Many guardians or parents try to mend the relationships on their own, which is often unproductive and leaves issues unresolved and relationships getting worse. It therefore calls for that neutral party to help facilitate the healing and restoration of relationships. The need for a professional family mediator becomes inevitable if our adolescents are to be helped in dealing with their own emotions, feelings, moods, and internal conflicts and relate well with not just their guardians and families, but with the society at large. It should also be noted that mediation does not just help two parties reconcile, but should start with the individual's internal healing and reconciliation. Thus the process of reconciliation should be done, should be one that is not rushed, but should be carried out with the mediator giving each party enough time to self-search and understand the other party for true reconciliation to be realized. Even as mediators work towards diffusion of tension and resolving on conflicts between the adolescents and their guardians or parents, they may not fully understand some of the adolescent issues that could be creating the conflicts. Thus the services of an expert in teenage or adolescent issues would be desirable to help bring out all the issues that the mediator may not have expertise in reaching out. However, if the mediator is also trained in teenage issues, could sort out without the need to bring an additional help. Mediators are conciliators, facilitators of restoration of relationships while remaining professional, impartial, and confidential in their work. And as I finish, we love our teenagers. We all work teenagers and adolescents once. Let us love them. Let us communicate with them. Let us bring them closer to ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Allow, and um, allow me to kindly invite uh, Dr. Sharon uh, for uh, her uh, input and her remarks. Dr. Sharon, kindly to mediator Margaret Kithai on her topic, mediation in adolescent guardian relations conflicts. Dr. Sharon? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. There, there's a lot of wonderful information in there and a lot of um, a, a lot of wonderful focus around the causes of conflict. Um, and and I, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to take the um, the this I'll be doing this with everybody. I'm going to be sounding probably like I'm really focusing on the things that I think you could do that might make it just a tighter piece. So, I, but I do want to start by saying that I really, really enjoyed what you had to say and really appreciate the way that you framed it. 
Um, I, I would encourage you in, in moving it forward as an article to think a little bit about just um, the flow, the order in which you're approaching things, Margaret, I, it, that it would be, I, I think that it, that you don't really get into the thesis statement, the, this is why, what I'm talking about until you've gone through the definitions a bit. And it would be really nice for somebody reading the article to be starting with, you know, that you're saying, what you're, you're saying is, there is conflict between parents and, and teenagers, parents and adolescents that can be well resolved by the use of the mediator. So saying that up front, that that's what you're going to talk about, and then saying, here's the kinds of, of conflicts, how you get there. I, I would encourage you to talk about the adolescents and the parents a little bit more together so that you're because you did a I think you'd say wonderful things about here's what happens with adolescents here's why they're working why they're engaging in conflict and I, and it would be nice to hear right after that the piece about and parents also have their reasons so that it flows that way um, and and the one thing I'd encourage you to also think about is tying a little bit more um, focus to what does a mediator do because if you're speaking about the mediator as being, um, you know, they're neutral, they come in. If you can talk a little bit specifically about um, what does it, why, why does it matter? Having a neutral person in the room, how does that help them to talk? And maybe find a few specifics that you can use. Um, like for instance, a mediator often changes the dynamic simply by being in the room and, and because the conversation goes, you know, back and forth through because both parties are trying to, you know, speak to the mediator and, and make sense to the mediator rather than looking across the table. But whatever it is that you think is the important pieces, it'd be nice to have a couple of those just so that somebody who doesn't know what a mediation looks like can, can imagine, oh, that's why it helps to have somebody else in the room. Because I think that many will imagine from, if you don't say it, they'll imagine that mediators are, are just telling people how to solve the problem. And that's not what you're saying. But I find that, that it's often what people hear if they don't know what mediators do or how they help. And I'm going to stop there, but I, I do want to say I absolutely, um, I really appreciate the, the way that you've done this. And I think that you've got some wonderful information there. Okay. Uh, Margaret Girai, would you have uh, any uh, remarks or any comments um, to that today to, uh, uh, following uh, Dr. Sharon's remarks? Thank you. And you're back to being muted, but it looks like not. <laughs> I'm really Margaret? grateful to you. I'm really grateful to you, Dr. Sharon. Oh. I'm just a beginner in this is my first time to be in such a such a program. I'm not yet a practicing a mediator, so I'm still uh, continuing with my studies. Mm -hmm. And I'm humbled by your comments, because it's an eye opener. It is opening me up. It's teaching me how to be and what to incorporate. And I'm grateful. And I thank you so much. And I will look forward to improving on my article. And I hope it, it gets to that to that level that is that is really good for, for printing. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. OK, um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, so the, the, that was uh, Margaret there to just enable us to start off. Um, a kind reminder to all the colleagues uh, and um, uh, as, as, as we advance on, you have access to the fellowship binder and the fellowship binder lists all the articles that uh, were received um, for, uh, during the course of the, uh, of the fellowship. They are in two categories. We have the feature written article and we have the blog articles. And we also have colleagues who submitted the feature article and the blog article together as was required. Um, a reminder that uh, 
for the colleagues who are listed under the feature written article that your presentation is seven minutes. Please keep to that time so that it can allow for um, the comments and also for us to advance on. For the colleagues who are submit are listed as, under the uh, blog uh, submissions of blog articles, your presentation will be three minutes. And uh, we have been having speaker trainings. So that means that we have been getting training so that we can be able to you know, determine what is for this presentation and what is actually in the, um, in the article um, itself. So we thank Margaret Dibai for um, warming us up as um, we were starting off. Um, the next uh, colleague that we have is um, uh, Isaiah uh, Kiplagat Meli. Isaiah, welcome. And uh, Isaiah, uh, Isaiah's presentation, um, his fellowship topic is on infused, infusing mediation in conflict resolution between the Teacher Service Commission and the Kenya National Union of Teachers for successful acquisition of quality in uh, uh, of quality education in Kenyan primary schools. Karibu sana, Isaiah. Okay, thank you very much. I hope everybody is listening to me. So my topic is on infusing mediation. between TSC and NAT in primary schools. Teacher service government to register, recruit, discipline, and remunerate teachers in Kenyan pub public primary schools. On the other hand, NAT is a recognized union that is Are we, are we, uh, Isaiah? Uh, we are losing your um, um, Isaiah? Isaiah Meli? Yeah, I'm afraid your sound is, is really not working well. <laughs> okay. Okay. The Teacher Service Commission, that is TSC, is a, a body mandated by the Kenyan government to register, recruit, discipline, and remunerate teachers in Kenyan public primary school. The Kenyan National Union of Teachers is an entity recognized to present teachers in labor matters with the employer. However, NAD is also a professional body whose ultimate aim is to ensure quality education by participating in policy formulation in matters education, ensuring proper policies is formulated to guarantee smooth teaching and learning in our public primary schools through its motto, service and justice. <clears throat> Teachers Service Commission and NAT conflicts. The conflict between TSC and NAT is not new in our education sector. We have witnessed times without number, the push and pull, court cases and open disagreement by the two stakeholders. So far, NAT has called out its members for a record six times since 1965 to date, losing quality time and money in terms of salaries paid to teachers who are on strike or, or legal fees. This is to the detriment of pupils in over 18,000 public primary schools in Kenya. This calls for a agreeable way in which the same can be handled without having major negative effects on our primary, uh, public primary school learners. Seven strikes by now so far. The strike, the first strike was in 1965 to demand for a single employer for all teachers. Since teachers were then were employed in different entities like churches and local government. The second strike was in the year 1969 when the government failed to implement SRC recommendations of teachers salaries review. In the year 1997, teachers went for a strike to demand for 20% salary increment. In 2002, teachers again went on strike to demand for implementation of the remaining six phases of teacher salary award. The year 2009 saw teachers going for another strike for, to force the government to remove contract teachers. This was followed by the strike of the year 2012 to force the government to harmonize teacher salaries and allowances with those of civil servants, which was slightly higher. This was followed by the latest, longest, which lasted for 35 days, 
in the year 2015 to address specific and resolve issues in the CBA. Currently, we have 331,232 teachers on TSE payroll, of whom 218 and 77 are primary school teachers, while 131, 155 belongs to the secondary school section. These exclude teachers on leave and those on interdictions. Number of pupils and students. There are 8,595 8, 8, pupils in public primary schools in Kenya, approximately 3.5 million counterparts in secondary schools. I'm sorry, there are 8 million 595 pupils in public primary school and approximately 3.5 million counterparts in secondary. Effects of strike. Uh, we have several effects of strikes. Uh, let me, okay. One is we have time lost, we have monetary loss, effects on teachers, pupils, and parents. The last strike by Teacher Service Commission of January 2015 lasted 35 days. This translates into 5 million and 40,000 minutes lost in eight lessons of 35 minutes a lesson of eight lessons per day in a single stream in the, in the 18,000 public primary schools in Kenya, meaning 176 million 400,000 quality contract hours per day between teacher and people are lost as a result. As a result. Simply put, 2,940,000 hours in the last strike, in the last 35 days strike. The total number of live lessons lost in the entire period is 25,200,000. Monetary loss. TSC had to pay teachers who are on strike, Kenya shillings 30 billion or US dollar 270,000, uh, the figures are slightly. And, and then the, the, the legal fees, currently not is still, still, still owes the, the legal team 400 million to date. Effects on teachers. Most teachers became frustrated as a result of being idle at home. Others became very depressed when they were evicted from their rental houses because salary delayed. Their morale was at its lowest ebb when they later reported to duty after the strike was called off, hence compromising quality of teaching. Effects of pupil on pupils. Pupils became idle, sometimes became pregnant. Since they were left at home alone with their, while parents went to working stations, they developed rebellious behavior that has resulted in strikes in schools. Even currently, you can see some of them burning dormitories. Perhaps maybe they are copying from their teachers who normally go on strike. Hence, academic performance is compromised. Parents suffered a lot of, a lot of financial obligations in, in card when pupils were at home. Those whose children acquired bad habits, bad habits were stressed. This could be the solution. One of the optical methods which would be employed to manage the conflict is mediation between the parties by independent mutual expert. Currently, TSC and NAT employs litigation, conciliation, arbitration, and negotiation. All these dispute resolution mechanisms, but there is a gap in that the process doesn't provide for a win win situation and restoration of relationship among other factors. Mediation is therefore comes in handy to bridge this gap with all its advantages. The parties therefore can continue engaging on critical matters as the mediation proceeds. Ultimately, mediation ensures mutual satisfaction resolution among and maintains peace between the disputing parties. Conclusion. Uh, it is therefore imperative that the TSC and NAT need a policy to adapt mediation into the future to forestall frequent labor disagreements, to ensure that learners, especially in the public primary school, are not disadvantaged by time lost in comparison to their counterparts in private schools. 
The government should also ensure that the required framework to facilitate mediation as a key strategy to solve the sacrament is put in place and, guide, and guided within the existing legal framework. Mediation as a part of guidance and counseling should be incorporated in the curriculum. This will ensure harmonious industrial relations between TSC and art, teachers and learners, hence smooth implementation of curriculum and hence quality education, which is a millennium development goal to be achieved. Thank you for, the, for listening to me. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I am going to um, uh, I'm going to apologize that there were little bits that I was not that I was losing Isaiah as you were talking. So I apologize if I missed something. Um, but I, I, I really quite liked much of the frame of what you were talking about. Um, and I would encourage you to think a little bit about things like um, you have some great numbers in there that are actually quite striking. And I think you've done a really good job about thinking about things that are, you know, here's some, here's some impacts that are happening in the school system. But you might want to think about which ones have the biggest impact because it, it, because you go through historic things like the years in which, um, in which strikes have taken place and then follow that with things like here's the numbers of students and things. You start getting, I was getting a little overwhelmed in the numbers before I started getting to the stuff where you were really good. Um, and it's more it really impactful when you're talking about the numbers of hours that are lost, the ways in which the, this is actually creating costs, the, the challenges that are happening, um, that are really current every time it happens and doesn't necessarily have to tie into the other ones. So you might want to think about if some of those earlier numbers are things that you could put in footnotes rather than build them out so that you're really emphasizing those other pieces and and you kind of have an equal thing about the financial the um the, the hours costs as well as the things that i think you did a really good job on around the morale and the teacher things like that so that you're you're really tying those things together and the focus is on these are the challenges that we're we're facing. Um, so so just give a little thought to which ones are are the most powerful and the most meaningful to what you're saying, and maybe place some focus there because I, I really think that they could jump out and really add to the add to the punch of what you're trying to say. But I thought it I thought it was a I thought it was well researched, well thought through, and and well presented. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, um, Isaiah Meli, for your presentation, and uh, thank you, Dr. Sharon, uh, for your remarks. Our next uh, presentation is um, Steve Mutinda Musembwa, followed by Pascalia Mainge and uh, uh, Mini uh, Mangeli. Uh, so, Steve Mutinda. Steve Mutinda. Steve Mutinda, if you're here, please send a message in the chat because we, uh, yeah, we can be able to see you now. Yes, we can be able to see you. Well, we can be able to see you. But yes, you're still muted. Uh, yes, you have the invite to unmute. Yes. Okay. Yes, so my name is... Uh... Steve Mutinda. Yeah, you can hear me? Yes, Steve Mutinda, we can hear you. Yeah, so my name is Steve Mutinda Mwemba. Yes, thank you. I'm an advocate of the act of I Court of Kenya based in Machakos. And uh, my topic for, the, for this course, for this fellowship is mediation and murder cases in Kenya. And um, the reason why I decided to write on this is because um, I've seen, yeah, I'm not a mediator myself, but I participated in mediation. Uh, we have gone to mediation uh, in courts, in courts uh, for cases involving my clients. But uh, most of the times we go for mediation for civil matters. You find that you are going for mediation for matters to do with succession or just matters involving family members. 
I've also seen that courts are also allowed mediation parties to settle their issues out of court in matters, uh, in cases, in criminal matters, for those matters, for those cases we call misdemeanors, the, those uh, offenses which attract sentences which is less than three years. But I've also been thinking about uh, mediation and other out of court settlements for cases for serious offenses like murder, manslaughter, and manslaughter. And uh, the reason why I've been thinking of this one is because there is an option which you can pursue in as, in, in, as a civil case. Because uh, do you see people going for compensation in my mind? So actually, I want a compensation by the court. So that is what I've been thinking about because murder cases actually in Kenya, there is no law which are, it is not allowed for mediation or another kind of out of court settlement for murder cases or another felony. Unless that one it has, has been moved by the authorities in prosecuting the offense. So in, uh, um, in, my, in my article, I've quoted one of the cases there is the case of um, Republic versus Mohammed Abdul Mohammed. And in that case, the court allowed the director of public prosecution to withdraw a case against an accused person. And that, that motion to withdraw the case was moved by the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. That one was after the parties of the victim had agreed with the family of the murder of the accused person, and they were the family of the victim was compensated. We, we were, the family was compensated. There are some rituals which were performed. So I believe follow, following the same 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 length, the another accused person called Abdullah Nur Muhammad made an application by himself, he made it to his counsel to have him being discharged to, for, the, to, for the court to withdraw the case against him. And they are the ones who move the, the court in this, this scenario, which is not the office of the director of publication. But the court went away and declined to allow that prayer. And the reason for that was that the court stated that which can only withdraw a case and not an accused person to make an application before the court. So once the DP office of the DPP opposes that application, it seems the court cannot allow it. Because even in our, in our constitution, and I believe under Article 157, sub Article 16, it is on the office of the DPP has powers to, with it, to exercise what you call the power of you know, the prosecute to discontinue any criminal proceedings at any stage. So what my question was, because the law does not allow for murder cases to be settled out of court unless the DPP withdraws that case. Can we now maybe you can have a suggestion? Maybe we have a regulation, we have a law for the parties to engage in mediation or engage in another kind of court, out of court settlement. And when they have engaged in that out of court settlement and they have reached a settlement, the victims of the uh, deceased person. And the, the families of the families of the accused person can they come to court and tell the court we have reached a Steve. What I was saying that 
Yeah, in that case of Republic versus Mohammed Abdo, the court declined. No, it's not that case. It is in the. the let me just get the case. Yeah, in the case of Republic versus Abdullah Noor, the court declined to allow an application for a party to have the to for the party. We, the accused was requesting the, the court to, uh, it was, it was making an application for the case to be withdrawn as the parties had reached an out of court settlement. And the court, the, yeah, the decision of the court was that it is only the office of the DPP which can we withdraw a case exercising his power at that 157 sub article 6c, the power of non prosecute, which is the power to discontinue any criminal proceedings at any stage before judgment. So my, the, my, the position is that you cannot settle murder cases out of court. And what I was suggesting that we love now to have a, a law or we have a management of our laws to allow maybe party to settle murder cases and other felonies out of court. And then but if the parties have reached that settlement, they can, they can come to court and make that application. The court can hear that the office of the DPP, because currently if the office of the DPP opposes such application, the application cannot be allowed. So in that case, once the, we have a law which allows for out of court settlement from other cases, then the court is the one with that option of deciding as to whether to withdraw the case or not. The reason why I, I, I'm talking about mediation in murder cases is because there is that there is that that we can be compensated. There is no benefit in which the victims will get from the judgment from imprisonment of the accused person, but they will get something if they reach as an agreement with the accused person, maybe to pay some, to have a compensation to the victims in, in monetary terms, at least they will have something they can use to improve their lives. As jailment does not assist them person apart from the, for the person who has been jailed. So that was my, that was my suggestion. I've also given in my article. I've also given uh, some some uh, some consideration which the court can make before it can release a part. It can make a. It can make its orders on an application to withdraw a charge against an accused person, like whose some of those considerations, like safety of the accused person, safety of the other members. So, um, society made opinions of the victims and we have a like, or law which allows for out of court settlement for murder cases. There are some considerations which the court can make, which include maybe the safety of the accused person, mostness of the accused person, opinions of uh, the, the charge should be withdrawn, and the undertaking by the accused person to change and such and that. That is what I said. Yeah, so so Steve, my apologies if anything that I say is something that you um, you definitely were already thinking about or had already talked about, because um, you cut out a few times for me. Um, but in terms of the, the kinds of things that I would encourage you to, to really think about um, in whatever you're writing, um, the, I think there's two pieces that, that kind of leap out for me. One of them is around um, just being really clear about who the parties are. So um, because, you know, there's there's definitely the, the victim's family in these kinds of cases or the victim, if it's a, in some circumstances, but with murder, it'll be the victim's family. Um, it could be the community as well, potentially, some of the community and the impacts. 
Um, but it also uh, just making sure that you refer to and and talk about why there is this structure where somebody else is making the decision. Um, because there is a presumption in any of the British based legal systems that um, that murder and things like that are crimes against the state. And the, so there's this protection piece. So just making sure you kind of talk about who are the different people who would have interests. Um, and the second piece that I would I would say probably needs to be um, just a strong piece is is looking at um, whether or not there might be a potential for something like this to turn into um, something that was really, really, um, there was a real disparity in that I could see, I could imagine circumstances in which rich offenders, for instance, are able to make deals with victims' families much more readily than somebody who doesn't have any money, um, and that there might be some concerns. So. I think that would be something that people would want to hear about is how you're thinking about the protections around that to ensure that that there are opportunities for this to work for everybody, as opposed to it really is just a way to buy your way out of a murder charge, which it, it, it and I'm not suggesting that that's what you think it is, but just just you want to make sure that you've you've spoken about it and addressed it. So definitely a, a placing a big focus on kind of how does this play out? Who's there? Who has those conversations? And what are the protections around it? Would be things that'd be really interesting. But I think I, I, I think this will be a really interesting paper when you when you finish it. Okay. Um, we thank thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharon, for your remarks, and uh, we thank uh, uh, Steve Mutembo for uh, his uh, presentation and his paper. Uh, and his fellowship topic is on mediation and murder cases in Kenya. Um, so Asante Sana, uh, uh, Steve Butinda Muthemba, Muthemba for your presentation. We now move on to uh, Pascalia Mainge for um, her, uh, her presentation. Pascalia Mainge, presentation on critical awareness of mediation to the public. Pascalia Mainge. Good morning, everybody. My fellowship topic today is on the critical awareness of mediation in the Kenyan public. On 4th April 2016, the judiciary in Kenya launched a pilot project to test, sorry. Sorry for that, let me begin. On 4th April 2016, the judiciary in Kenya launched a project pilot to test the effectiveness of court annex mediation as an effective alternative forum of resolving disputes in a faster, affordable, and more amicable way. Further, Article 159.2c of the Kenyan constitution mandates the judiciary to promote alternative mechanisms of alternative dispute resolution in the administration of justice. This is also given effect by the Civil Procedure Act, which is in chapter 21 of the Kenyan laws. After the success of the pilot project and in line with the transformational framework in 2018, the judiciary embraced alternative district resolution as an avenue of addressing the cases backlog in the court system while making, while making, more accessible, while making justice more accessible. Since the inception of the court annex mediation, it has helped to clear the backlog of judiciary cases. In 2019-2020, the a total of 3,589 cases were referred for mediation, and out of these, 1,777 were successfully settled. <laughs> With, with Kenya shilling 13.5 billion held in litigation in that period being released back to the economy as reported in the Kenya State of Judiciary Report 2020. Further, access to justice is a prerequisite for sustainable and inclusive development through the entrenchment of justice into the Sustainable Development Goal or the SDG 16 which discusses the ability to access justice as a crucial component of securing peaceful, 
just, inclusive societies where affordable and effective institutions govern at all levels as recognized in the Kenyan judiciary. So what is the problem here? As stated by the former Chief Justice, Honorable, uh, Honorable David K. Maraga, in a report of the 10th Geneva Forum of Judges and Lawyers in March 2020, the, nation, the national prosperity cannot be shared with the majority of the population, cannot be shared when the majority of the population cannot access justice. The, there is a need for individuals right from the villages and the grassroots level and the marginalized to share their understanding of their access to justice, which should then be incorporated into the mainstream thinking and practices. Now, this is where the ADR model stands out. Several reasons underlie the low proliferation of ADR in Kenya, chief among them being the natural human inclination to resist change, defined attitude by the majority in the legal fraternity to embrace ADR, and a dire lack of sensitization of the masses on its benefits for purposes of enhancing justice. This can also be attributed to the jurisprudence of the British colonial rule in Kenya, whose influence and model is still practiced in our judiciary, as well as our educational system, with limited resources and inaccessibility to justice. Kenyans know all too well that court processes can be very lengthy, tedious, and quite expensive. In addition, matters left to the court to rule upon can leave one party disgruntled. Now, the displeased party can then appeal to the court ruling leading to an extension of the court case, which most probably takes a long period to conclude. A report in the Kenyan judiciary, that is in the judiciary research paper number one of 2021, reported that the number of cases that were resolved in all courts were reduced from 469,359 in the financial year 2019-2020 to 289,000 cases, <coughs> excuse me, when the COVID pandemic struck, leading to a massive backlog of cases. Drawing from this report, it then becomes very prudent for alternative dispute resolutions to be enhanced and public and, and widely practiced in the Kenyan Republic. With a population of about 55.2 million in Kenya and a decentralized system of governance, with the enactment of new constitution, part of the plan was to bring its services and resources closer to the citizens with access to, sit, to justice being very pre pre predominant. Before its um, enactment, Kenya had 47 counties and 290 sub-counties, 39 high courts and 129 magistrate courts who are spread across the counties. The justice population ratio, therefore, was one judge to 304,000 citizens, as reported in the 2019-2020 Kenya State of Judiciary Report. Difficulties encountered in, accessing, uh, in uh, obtaining access to justice reinforced poverty and inclusion in all the communities. The benefits of dispute resolution, in a general sense, are almost self-evident as the resolution of disputes saves time and resources, reduces stress and conflicts, and promotes social integration, cohesion, and harmony. So what is the objective of my talk? One, our objective will be aligned to the Kenyan Vision 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals, including the SDG 16.3, which commits the international community to promote the rule of law at the international and the national levels, as well as to ensure equal access to justice for all by the year 2030. We shall be looking at a few key considerations with regard to educating the masses on the cost benefit analysis of utilizing mediation as a dispute resolution mechanism. Two, we shall be accessing the citizens understanding of the potential role of mediation as a formal or informal mechanism in alternative or complementary justice paths. 
this will be done against the backdrop of people's perspective of litigation as the superior dispute resolution mechanism. Three, to educate communities to understand about the informal and the formal justice systems and to sensitize them right from the grassroots level on the benefits, objectives, and objectives of mediation as an ADR mechanism vis-a-vis -vis the formal justice system of litigation. Benefits like confidentiality, time constraints, preservation of relationships, and reduced costs, among others, will be highlighted. Lastly, capitalizing on the real-time benefits of mediation when juxtaposed against a litigation process as a way of realizing amicable solutions while maintaining confidentiality, respect, and justice, among others. So how are we going to go about this? Where do we begin this sensitization process? The most obvious environment would be at the grassroots, where ignorance of ADR is quite rife. Some methodologies which we will, we will apply would include training and sensitizing the village elders, the chiefs and the sub-chiefs, women, uh, women and men groups, circles, and establishing forums on the significance and importance of ADR. We shall also work jointly with the legal fraternities, the human rights groups, churches, teachers associations uh, to create a buzz in their respective communities. We shall advocate for friendly mediation uh, centers across the various counties where cases can be resolved within a, a 60 days period of time with less frustration, especially for the more emotive cases like land and family feuds, which are in the majority. Being set up in these localities, we will ensure easy accessibility, affordability, and timely resolution of disputes with sensitivity to culture, which will ultimately lead to many embracing this model of justice. We shall present mediation as a win-win solution in disputes, being a newer process than arbitration or litigation. It has been and is still being used to resolve labor, commercial, community disputes and, dis and divorce cases. As I bring this to a conclusion, mediation is one of those mechanisms used in alternative dispute resolution to solve disputes and to come up with a realistic settlement in, just, in a just and humane manner. The question that begs is, what percentage of the Kenyan public is aware of this fact? It is said that knowledge is power while ignorance is bliss. Through the sensitization process, we expect to have an, up, to have an update of the process in the various counties in the country. Hence, easing the burden of backlogs, backlogs in our judiciary systems, ensuring easy and affordability access to duty, justice, as well as a speedier resolution of processes. Mediation, ladies and gentlemen, is fast catching up on a global phenomenon. Hence, the urgency to present it as such to the communities. It is meant to complement and not to compete with the existing litigation system of justice. Thank you. Back to you, Wangari. Asante Sana for your presentation. Dr. Sharon, kindly. Yeah, and, and thank you very much for that. Um, I, I, what I'm going to, uh, what I'm going to focus on here is just um, what you've presented is, is definitely um, designed as a talk and as a presentation. And so, so thinking about it just with, here's what we're going to do and ladies and gentlemen, it's got that kind of flavor to it. Thinking about um, having it as a paper. So as something somebody's going to read, I would really encourage you to think about starting with um, where, you, where you kind of got to second, which was really the, um, what's the problem? And starting with, you know, so these are the things that are at issue and that need to be resolved. It might make sense, the pieces that you were doing about, hey, there have been some efforts in the courts to do things, um, which you started with. There have been these pilot projects. It, it could transition quite nicely into that, saying the courts have tried to make some efforts to make these changes, but they haven't, they haven't gone far enough. Because what I hear you saying really is that it really needs to be beyond the courts. When you're talking about this public sensitization, when you're talking about 
the importance of, of the communication to such a broad range of people. I, I, what I, I understand you to be saying is that mediation or and other forms of alternative dispute resolution, the way to get to access to justice is to sh have everybody recognize it could happen before courts. Um, so you might want to think about whether um, some of the things that happen in other places where there's pre-litigation protocols, requirements that you can't even file unless you've mediated before, or whether there's, um, or whether what you're, you're hoping is that there'll be uptake in community mediation. And you do talk about that. You talk about the formal and the informal, but I'd encourage you to just make that, that, that broader statement about there are some things the court's doing and that might not be enough for access to justice. Here's some other things and ways in which it can happen before it even gets to the courts. So anyway, get a thought, just a few thoughts about um, some framing for a paper flow that might work well for you. Okay. Uh, thank you. For, thank you very much, uh, uh, Pascal Yamengi, for your, uh, your presentation on critical awareness of mediation to the public. Um, our next presentation is uh, Mini Mangeli uh, with the fellowship topic, Mediation and Devolution in Kenya, a case for mediation centers in all counties in Kenya. Welcome. Good morning, and I'm happy to be here. And as you heard, my fellowship topic is on mediation and devolution in Kenya, a case for mediation centers in all counties in Kenya. My grandmother once told me that to negotiate is to win. And, to fail, and failure to negotiate is to lose all the same. And in one word, I would call this mediation. Clearly, she knew what she was talking about. And in terms of the introduction to my paper, I imagine a society where family, civil, labor, and commercial disputes are resolved through mediation in every county, where the citizens uh, know about mediation and its benefits and where some citizens do not travel for hours on end uh, in search of justice and um, in the intimidation uh, by the court structures uh, and sometimes cases taking too long. What would this mean if cases were settled in 60 days? This would mean that the general public would have enough time to even concentrate on other economic uh, affairs in their hands. This paper or this uh, uh, statement uh, will seek to answer some of these questions and address uh, the possibilities of establishing mediation centers in all counties in Kenya. If cases was, uh, were settled through mediation, citizens would be empowered to carry out their economic activities without delay. They would, they would be knowledgeable about mediation, which would result in restoration of relationships, and most importantly, a win-win situation for the disputing parties. Noting that whenever there are intergovernmental disputes in the counties, the services of the people are affected the most. Conflict between communities has a negative impact on the people and their livelihoods. Mediation would be a sure way to deal with the community dispute and have the families and communities live in harmony. And I think my, my, my colleague has uh, alluded to this. Kenya has a disparity between its population that stands at 55.2 million and the justice delivery on the other hand. The justice uh, ratio now stands at one judge to about 304,000 citizens. And out of the 47 counties in the country, only 39 counties have high court station. Currently, there are 127 uh, magistrate courts in the entire country. So what does that mean? It is clear indication that there's justice gap that exists over the years. An example of uh, Busia County in the western part of the country has seven sub-counties and has a population of about 893,000. Uh, uh, speaking during the court users uh, open day in Busia, the Chief Justice Honorable Lucy Ambani urged the, the residents to adopt alternative dispute resolution spirit to, zo to resolve cases uh, at home instead of matters uh, taking matters to court that will probably take uh, you know, over 10 years to resolve. 
she confirmed that there are over 5,000 criminal cases and 4,000 uh, civil cases uh, in her station where there are six judicial officers and two judges. So you can see the disparity I'm talking to uh, earlier in the paper. Uh, cases of criminal nature, however, we all know that they cannot be mediated. Mediation is not the only way to resolve disputes. There is no doubt, therefore, that the public could benefit greatly uh, from awareness for, on other available ways to which they can use uh, to access justice. The judiciary and other justice stakeholders should sensitize the public on other available avenues in accessing justice. For instance, the government pays a lawyer to handle criminal cases where citizens cannot afford to hire a lawyer. There are organizations in the country like Kituo Sharia, the Legal Aid Advice Center, Federation of Women Lawyers, amongst others, that take up legal cases on behalf of the citizens who are less unfortunate in our country. Uh, that's information also that can go out there to help citizens know that they can access justice elsewhere. The only downside to this is that most of these organizations are based you know, in Nairobi, and very few of these organizations have organ uh, uh, some of these offices outside Nairobi. Uh, so there's need to also uh, uh, raise awareness around this. In terms of the legal framework, mediation is a form of the ADR, and I think my colleague alluded to this mechanism, and it is worth noting that disputes can be mediated, that, that not all disputes can be mediated. Communities in earlier years embraced ADR, and it worked for the citizens very well. The Council of Elders were organized then, and even now, uh, they continue to work around uh, their organization in ways that they continue to resolve disputes at family and community levels. For example, the Njurinjeke uh, is a supreme governing council of elders for the Meru community, and the Kiama Kiama for the Akikuyu community, and the Atumia Madome for the Akamba community. So this can work uh, in tandem with mediation and other ADR uh, mechanisms. Since the enactment of the 2010 constitution, the country is slowly embracing mediation and ADR. Uh, it is, my colleague also alluded to the fact that now uh, ADR is anchored under Article 159 to see of the constitution. The use of ADR, which includes um, uh, arbitration, conciliation, traditional justice systems, and mediation is however not new as we have seen. Um, and and uh, unlike litigation, mediation provides an environment in which parties to the dispute work jointly to, a, to attain the desired solution. There is need to popularize mediation now more than ever before, considering its benefits, which include speedy uh, settlement of cases, low costs, confidentiality, and a win-win for all the disputing parties. So why devolution and uh, mediation in all the counties? The devolved governments have authority that de is derived from the constitution to deliver services to the citizens at the grassroots level. The main motivation of devolution in our country is to bring services closer to the people and ensure proper distribution of resources. In Article 174F of the constitution, mandates the devolved governments to promote social, economic, or economic development and provision of proximate, easily accessible services throughout Kenya. As a way to bring justice closer to the people, the judiciary, uh, in collaboration with the county governments, should establish centers in all the 47 counties. Many people, and especially the less disadvantaged uh, uh, citizens in our country, are denied justice simply because they cannot access the courts. And even when they do, it is not guaranteed that justice will be, will be fair. Hence, the need to establish mediation, mediation centers in all the counties. Uh, mediation centers will then allow the citizens uh, from specific localities to travel very short distances to have their cases heard and settled within a very short time as opposed to litigation that sometimes takes even up to 10 years. So how can mediation reduce poverty in our country? 
when you look at the, 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 the first sustainable development goal on poverty eradication, this can only be achieved partly if the citizens are empowered first to know about mediation and to be able to use mediation in their own localities. This will ensure that disputes are resolved within a very short time, leaving the disputants with enough time to carry on with their daily activities. The mediation uh, centers will be managed by professional mediators, will go a long way in supporting the citizens to thrive economically, enhance re relationships and ensure service delivery to the citizens. This will no doubt uh, bring cohesiveness and ensure that the dignity of the people involved is restored. This will reduce the high burden of even cost that is attached to human resources in our courts. Uh, I will not touch on this. My colleague earlier on uh, indicated the mediation analysis, the numbers, and I think I will just skip this and I'll go straight to the way forward on the establishment of the, uh, of the mediation centers. It would be very important to create, the, the, to create awareness right from the departments of the national government, uh, the governor's offices to the grassroots uh, levels on the process of mediation and how mediation centers would work. The devolved governments and the national government should work together with other uh, stakeholders in the ADR fields to develop a strategic document on how to popularize mediation as a mechanism to resolve disputes at the community level. The county government should enlist the churches, the chief's offices in the sub counties to spread the word on how mediation can be used to resolve disputes and also set a budget aside to fund the operations uh, of the centers with possible help from the national government and the judiciary. This should do, be done by way of establishing the structures so that the counties uh, can have the buy-in uh, from the citizens who will then use the mediation centers. The development of the uh, mediation handbook will also be very important. The mediation rules and how uh, the mediation centers will operate, this will also be very, very important. In conclusion, after 10 years of devolution in the country, uh, time is right for the national and the county governments to establish mediation centers in all the counties. The best thing that happened to the country is when the constitution was enacted in 2010, which gave hope to the use of ADR in the country. A clear roadmap uh, where mediation is at the moment and the results of establishing the mediation centers should be developed in consultation with all the key stakeholders. To begin with, the government could utilize the already uh, structures that are in place uh, within the counties. The county commissioner's office, for instance, the chief's offices uh, could create room for the mediation centers so that the government is not starting right from the beginning. It is the country, uh, it, if the country is to achieve access to justice for all and reduce poverty, then the creation of mediation centers is an urgent matter that needs to be addressed now going forward. Um, as I conclude again, uh, with proper policies, procedures and rules, these will be able to support the mediation center uh, so that they are able to work in the right way. I thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for that. Um, I, I, I'm going to kind of, I, lots of good information in there, lots of, um, I, I would like to compliment you on the start, which was actually really catchy, like really caught my attention as you started out with the reference to, you know, your grandmother and moving it into kind of, I, I thought you moved it very nicely into this, into the discussion about you know what, there, there's no way that one can provide justice with these kinds of numbers. It simply isn't there, it's too expensive. And so the solution isn't, isn't to add more judges, right? The solution is to do something else. Um, what I would encourage you to do is um, have a more direct path from that kind of initial frame to where you get to at the end, which is um, because 
for a while there, I wasn't really clear that what you were saying was, hey, there was, there's, they've been funding legal aid, it's a challenge, it can't be funded enough. Some money should be spent instead in funding mediation centers. Um, and so really going quite directly to, this isn't the solution to just keep paying more and more and more judges because it doesn't serve the purpose and it doesn't do all of the things that you talked about positives about mediation as well. So potentially a better move is to spread this out. It has the potential to have that grassroots based piece. You say all of those things, I would just kind of go more directly into it and make that a bigger part of the focus. Um, because I, I don't think you need to say some of the other things in between. Your, those, are, those are your real key points. And then you can spend a little bit more time on what does it mean to do it in the community and, and how does placing something in the community actually meet exactly what you're, you're hoping to accomplish, that spreading the word happens because you have somebody in the media in the community, a funded center in the community that can include outreach, that can include all of those kinds of, of, of services. I think you're saying all of those things, Minnie, and just saying like the, the really straight line from one to the other is what I'd love to hear. So all thank right. you so much. All yeah, right. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharon. I think I get your comment. Sure. Okay, thank you. You're muted, Wangari. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mini, for your presentation on uh, mediation and devolution in Kenya, uh, case for mediation centers in all counties in Kenya. And uh, Dr. Sharon, for you, Dr. Sharon, for your comments. We now invite uh, Mediator Magdalene Mwele, Mag Mediator Magdalene N. Mwele. Um, her fellowship topic is on um, mediation as a determinant of implementation of readmission policy of girls after teenage pregnancy <coughs> in public schools in Makwendi County in Kenya. Uh, Magdalene Wele, welcome. Thank you, thank you so much and good morning. It's still good morning for everyone. Um, my name is Magdalene Wele, I'm a psychologist by profession, but in 2019, I also uh, trained as a mediator. I've been implementing uh, counseling programs for the last 17 years as a wellness coordinator for TSA employees. Um, but uh, in the last five, five months, I was deployed to Makueni County. And that is when uh, my paradigm, my thinking of uh, shifted to another paradigm, shift from uh, implementing the the programs for teachers alone to, to also include the learners. And so my topic is about uh, in, in mainstreaming mediation program in the policies of readmission of learners who have uh, our young teen, teenage girls who have uh, fallen, uh, who, who get pregnant in the middle of their education uh, process. And we, uh, I am looking at how my my top my, my research is going to to enhance the the already existing pro, pro, uh, legislation by the Minister of Education, the Basic Education Act 2013, my um, days that all learners who our girls who become pregnant, they are supposed to be re admitted back to the schools. But then what I have noted is that when, one, when a girl falls pregnant, there, there is bitterness among the parties. And within the education system, there are very, uh, very important the parties. We have, uh, we have the, the parent who is our key stakeholder we, or the guardian. We have the teacher and then the learner. It's kind of a triangle. And I've realized when uh, pregnancy occurs, the three have their own perceptions and each of them will be blaming the other one. 
and then there exists a toxic relationship and between the learner and their their parent they is, they are going to feel their there is a, a let down the, 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 the our daughter did not focus on what we send them to school to do and uh, the teachers also will, will feel that this girl is likely to be a bad influence to the rest of the girls and more so if the girl is in a boarding school and then uh, uh, the girl herself also they develop because of this and demolishing their self-esteem is quashed. They also feel they have failed themselves and they are they, the two uh, other points of the triangle, the teachers and, and, and the parents. And so for the last, uh, when I came up with this topic uh, last month, I felt there is some cap. Uh, oh, we have, all right, we have the counseling departments in our schools. Counseling is about empowering the client, but you realize mediation has the ability, and uh, it has also the, the 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 climate. It can create a climate, a platform where the three parties can be brought together, and the school can play a, a major platform in this uh, process of mediation, whereby we create that enabling environment that even the learner who is being readmitted again is coming to find a school, an environment that is going to accept her without uh, tagging her to be a bad influence. And the parent will be talked to, to support, to appreciate that it's in life one can fall apart and the, 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 their daughter is uh, planning to go back to, to achieve their career progression. And then uh, to the girl herself, the teenage mother, to be congratulated for even picking herself again and continue with her career. And so what I've noted the, the, the practice is that this girl will not want to go back to the same institution they'd want to go to a different institution, which will, again will become a challenge to the parent to start all over again, to initiate a process of and admission to a, a new school. And therefore, I feel mediation will create, will enhance the existing policy of re admission. If the, 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 the Kenyan government, if the Minister of Education mainstreams mediation as a determinant as part of because right now it is counseling for the girl counseling for the parents counseling for the, the the teachers but you realize uh it does not still it has not been uh, able to 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 enable us uh, have 100 percent retention of these learners to their institution and therefore because the Basic Education Act, one of our goals is to have 100% retention of our learners to the learning institution and 100% uh, transitioning to the next level of their career. That when mediation is brought on board, this, I have a, a, a strong feeling that it is going to help. And therefore, in my paper, I am planning to, to, to draw up a, a framework uh, on how mediation can be mainstreamed in the readmission re re policy of the teenage girls or mothers to back to their uh, learning institution. And I feel that it will also have brought a lot of uh, harmony also in the community because the parents who had also become like uh, a loving stock, oh, your daughter was not able to make it, that they still again put themselves together because they have been taken through the, that process. Their, their, their emotions have been calmed down and they have also been brought to, to, to a, a harmony with the school administration and even the community itself. And therefore, in Makweni, 
it's one of the counties uh, that are semi, uh, hard to reach and the terrains um, are more uh, are vast. But uh, I have also noted that they are implementing pack, uh, partners, they are organization on the ground who are also interested in supporting mediation programs, in supporting peace and harmony. And so in my paper, I also, as a way forward, I am planning to, to suggest on how we can uh, approach or involve partners on developing implementing partners, especially the ones, the local implementing partners who are already putting programs in place to also mainstream in their programs mediation for uh, our learners, our, our teenage mothers, because these, these partners are already supporting them in other ways. Uh, uh, but I, I, I realize that we can infuse the mediation program in their programs. And so that is going to make my, my focus uh, of my study, of my research. And I want to believe that it is going to had a lot of value, enhance the already existing efforts by our government of retaining our learners in school. And uh, I hoping them also to, to actualize their destinies through their career progression, despite the fact that they have fallen prey of teenage pregnancies. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I do want to say I, I find the, your topic really interesting because I find I, I, I'm aware of other kinds of reintegration programs, but I actually have not heard of one that is really specific to that particular um, topic, to looking at, at the teenage girls and that particular kind of reintegration. So, this, so it, I think that you've got a topic that will be seen as really interesting and original. So it has the potential to be read elsewhere. If you do a really good job of it, I think this is one that, that other people will be interested in other places um, because you will see things about reintegration from people who are coming out of prison. You see things about you know, bringing people back into community when there's been um, criminal actions and breaches. So it tends to be more there as opposed to this, which is, is very much not, not a criminal setting, but can create that sense of shame in much the same ways and have some of the same relationships. So I would say you might want to, in your research, look at those other kinds of things that do exist to pick up some of the 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 approaches that are used in mediation that because i think there'll be some that are really closely related around what are the values what are the objectives what are the things that can be accomplished in terms of building plans for reintegration because you do see some of those so i think there's there's stuff that will be analogous for you to pull on and that will, if you want this to be the kind of paper that gets picked up and read more broadly, and I think it has the potential because it's really quite unique, um, then being able to tie it into these other ones that happen in other places will show that you've really, you understand mm -hmm. all of the things that are around it. So I would encourage that, and I know that's kind of saying go outside of what you're doing, but looking at how it connects, I think could be really good. Um, and, I, and I would say in doing that, one of the things you might want to place your own focus on is thinking about it as this, this as being something that, that causes a breach in relationship, a break in, in trust relationships. And the reason I say that is because I think you'll find it really easy then to talk about the ways in which mediation helps to helps to build plans helps to build trust helps to rebuild relationships um, so that it doesn't end up it, it's clearer what the distinction is between that and the counseling roles that are already in play mm -hmm. it's this is it it's about that repair and the reparation and and there's yes. a moving forward piece so i would say like those are the, the pieces i would say focus on and i think you can get something really really interesting out of it yeah, so thank you so much. Well, well, th thank you so much, Dr. Sharon, for your input. I yeah. look forward to 
maturing this paper and I I promise I will take note of your input. And if I if I get stuck, I will still consult you. In a, yes, in please a, feel free. And, and I'll say that yes. that's 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 for everybody. I mean, to, please do feel free. I'm giving like I'm I'm aiming for kind of one minute feedback. If you want to talk further, please do reach out. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Magdalene Mwele, for your presentation, and Dr. Sharon for your insights and input to um, Dr. Uh, Ma uh, Magdalene uh, N. Mwele's uh, topic. Uh, our next uh, presentation would be from uh, mediator Philomena Chege. I am not sure that we see you um, in the session. Mediator Philomena Chege, followed by mediator Sarah Tell. And then we will go to um, uh, mediator Marjorie Mburu, Jimburu. Uh, Mediata Wairimu Grace and Mediata Caroline Wanjiko Njuguna. So I believe that uh, we then proceed on to Mediata Sarah Tell for your presentation. Good morning, everybody. Good uh, evening, uh, Dr. Sharon. Um, my presentation is. Uh, Mediation and the blue economy. Is this the magic bullet for development? Mediation is an alternative dispute resolution mechanism in which a third party, who is an independent neutral, assists the parties in dispute to find a solution. The principles of mediation include confidentiality, voluntariness, mediator impartiality and party autonomy. In Kenya, the quota next mediation program was introduced in 2016 and is loaded for releasing huge amounts that were previously tied in commercial and family disputes back into the economy. This, in spite of the concern that the quota next mediation program seemingly disregards the voluntary aspect of mediation. The question therefore is, which model of mediation should be adopted for the blue economy? Would such a model be the only requirement to achieve development in the blue economy? The blue economy refers to sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods and jobs, while preserving the health of the ocean. There is increasing focus on the blue economy, leading to an increase in the number of people who rely on the oceans. This is likely to lead to increased numbers and intensities of conflict. This is where mediation could come in handy as a tool to curtail a possible surge in conflict. Conflict over natural resources, such as the ocean, often stems from issues of access for different users, issues of management, such as policies that are put in place to govern both access and use, as well as issues of rights of other resources. Given the principles of mediation, it can be applied to support collaborative management of ocean resources. Mediation can therefore be used as a governance tool to support sustainable conservation and management of ocean resources. The principle of party autonomy is relevant in empowering local communities that depend on those resources to have a say in both the management and utilization of resources they rely on for their livelihoods. Furthermore, the principle of mediator impartiality makes a case for the engagement of skilled mediators to work with communities as they align interests and uses. So how do we achieve this collaborative management of the blue economy using mediation? First, the actors within the blue economy sector need to be made aware of mediation and its potential. Mediators need to reach out explaining what they do and giving practical examples of roles they can take up and how their involvement could bring about positive change for the blue economy and those who rely on the blue 
economy. Secondly, mediators need to show interest in the blue economy. They need to be deliberate about gaining some basic knowledge and understanding of the blue economy and how different actors rely on it to meet ecological, economic, and, and social cultural needs. This is useful in playing the facilitative role in mediation and helping people align their interests as well as appreciate the needs of different resource users. Finally, mediators must adopt a conflict transformational approach in working with the users and managers of the blue economy. Mediation should go beyond providing settlement options such as helping develop do and don't guidelines, putting in place zones for different users, or providing licenses. They should seek to help the actors explore and address deep-seated issues that could arise from perceptions about culture and historical injustice. This will ensure that the proposed strategies can be used over the long term. Is mediation the singular solution to achieving a sustainable blue economy? A reflective consideration of the principles of mediation is necessary. Confidentiality is a critical component of the mediation process, and it is important for all parties involved to appreciate that. Building trust and participating in good faith is more readily achieved when parties are assured of confidentiality. Willingness to participate or voluntariness is a function of the party's understanding of the mediation process and appreciating its potential. In this regard, mediators have a role to play in listening to and addressing party concerns. This is also tied to the party's perception of the mediator. Therefore, mediators must be above board and ready to declare any slight possibility of conflict of interest. In addition, mediators must be willing to step aside whenever necessary in order to maintain the integrity of the mediation process. Party autonomy is another key component. Representatives of the parties should be a true reflection of the parties they are representing and should be able to act independently, devoid of threats and inducements. In addition, while mediation does play a significant role, Used alone, it has its shortcomings. Both scientific research and indigenous knowledge must be considered in order to make sound decisions governing the blue economy. In addition, uh, supporting policies and frameworks are needed in order to implement the proposals arrived at during mediation. Continued capacity building and upskilling is required for both mediators and resource managers, where local communities need to be empowered to have a voice concerning the blue economy resources. So what is the way forward? This article puts forward proposals that could be employed by mediators in providing services towards sustainable management of the blue economy. They can also be further refined and improved. In the meantime, mediators should step up and show up to support the blue economy by providing their services. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm happy to receive your feedback. Great. Thanks, Sarah. I, I will say that you present in such a nice flowing way that, that it's often, um, I'm often caught with just the way you're speaking. Um, so I, I, there's a couple pieces that I think you could emphasize, though, that I, that I just admit because you're speaking so nicely that I'm kind of going along with the flow and I um, and, and just finding that it's really appealing. Um, I, I would encourage you to think about um, about starting more with the kinds of things that you get into a little bit later, because um, you started with getting into things like there was a court annexed program there were these kinds of things and i'm not sure that it really matters with what you're talking about because what you're talking about is a very specific place where you see mediation being used and it kind of doesn't matter that it's been used somewhere else you know what you're saying is there 
you're saying, I think most meaningfully, that there there's a growing potential for these kinds of resource things, that there's increased use, that there's increased potential for conflict. Um, and I think you say that well. And I, I think that for people who don't know much about blue economy, it's also helpful to give a few really specific things so that it catches more people than just the ones who actually are already engaged in that work so that you're you're you can bring in some other people to what does that mean you know there's going to be more conflict there's more natural resource things it doesn't need to be a lot you don't need to go down that path but just you know here's a few examples of what those might look like so that we all have the same kind of idea of who the parties might be in mind as you go into the the, the conversation about how you're going how you want to engage the parties and how they might benefit from these different things because I think it's really easy for people who aren't doing that work to just, you know, go, okay, I can only imagine one thing that could be, but I think you're saying that it could be a lot and that there's huge potential. Um, so I would say that would be, that would be really good. Um, and if you have the, the, the time in a paper, um, and that will depend on how much you turn this into a much more full article, you may want to go deeper into some of those um, those ideas that you have for how it how people can gain traction there in the area, because I think it could be both mediators getting the experience you're talking about in terms of understanding and throwing themselves into understanding those areas, and potentially is it is it working <coughs> to bring in people from those areas into the mediation fold and learn those skills or. Yeah, there, there's a little bit more, I think, to be built out there as to who's doing this work, if you need this kind of knowledge and skill set, and how does that come out. But uh, I, I think it, uh, it, it's already got a really nice framework, it's getting a nice flow. And, uh, and what you want to do is bring in a few more people <laughs> into the who don't know already what the blue economy is, because you'll find lots of people who don't even know that term but would be interested in the topic. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Medita Sarah Chair, for your fellowship topic on mediation and the blue economy. Is uh, this the magic bullet for development? And Dr. Sharon, for your insights and remarks. Um, uh, Medita Emerald Nidega's topic is on uh, conflict transformation in family disputes through uh, mediation and ODR, specifically on divorce custody battles and proprietary rights. We will move to the presentation uh, by uh, mediator um, uh, Marjorie Jimboro on uh, good health and uh, well-being in uh, in mediation. That is uh, mediator Marjorie Boro for her presentation. And. Uh, I believe then that we move to the next uh, presentation. Uh, Medita Marjorie Mboro, when you get uh, into the session, uh, you are, uh, uh, yeah, we are, as uh, you're ready to speak, you may kindly um, alert um, on the chat. Uh, we now invite uh, Medita Wairimo Grace on the fellowship topic, uh, Mediation, a Bridge to Family uh, Conflicts. Mediation, a Bridge to Family Conflicts. Okay, welcome, very much, Grace. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and good evening to Sharon for the part time difference there. I've already been introduced, and my topic has already been introduced. So, our I'll just go straight into my presentation. When I was young, we used to sing about London Bridge being broken down and how we were going to build it up again. Was it with mud and stones and we sang and sang or other various materials? This made me curious to date as I often wondered how a bridge is constructed. Ladies and gentlemen, do you also wonder how a bridge is constructed? Well, I'm not a structural engineer. I do hope we have some 
uh, in our midst, maybe who can shed some light to us. But what I gathered as I did my investigation is a bridge is a physical man-made structure to help us cross over obstacles like valleys, oceans, and rivers, and has been there since time immemorial, proving that uh, indeed, necessity is the mother of invention. In a family too, there are many deep-seated conflicts which have been unresolved across generations, and they just started off as just, just mere differences, disagreements, they escalated to problems and uh, to disputes and have created also obstacles within the family relationships, and when left and resolve, they cannot escalate into violence and even war. A conflict can be defined as a clash which comes about because of differences in um, interest in our actions, uh, what we see we can benefit, values, opinions, uh, or even direction amongst uh, people and often perceived as threats. I talk to you today to delve deeper into family conflict and how mediators bridge bridges or a bridge during the mediation process by assisting the disputing parties in very dignified ways to resolve the family conflict and cross over uh, the bridge to the other side of conflict, which is more peaceful and healthier family relationships. A family is a social unit which is made up of two or more people related by blood, marriage, or adoption, and they have a shared commitment to the mutual relationship. The family structure is the way in which the family is organized according to roles, to rules, responsibilities, and hierarchies, so that each family member is able to fulfill their agreed upon roles and honor their responsibilities, treat each other with honor, uh, respect, and affection, and meet each other's needs within the family, like the survival needs, socialization, language development, morality, and spiritual training, uh, just to name uh, a few. Uh, according to Altlon, who developed the circumflex model, which conceptualizes three key var variables, that is flexibility, uh, cohesion, and communication. Uh, and these three do define family interactions. Too little flexibility often leads to rigidity, while too much flexibility results in chaos. Therefore, family members should only strive to strike a balance, like being flexible, so that they, uh, like uh, being flexible, I give, I'll give an, um, an example of the leadership style or role. When the leadership is too rigid or uh, too chaotic, then there'll be no stability. But if there's a little change, like being flexible, like let's say when family members grow from bringing children to teenagers or to adults, then the leadership style can change. Uh, that's what I mean by flexibility and uh, the family can strike a balance. And uh, this way, the family will maintain healthier uh, family relationship. And uh, this can also be negotiated by the family members when family members feel that, you know, there's too much rigidity in the way the leader, the leader is uh, steering the family. The degree of family cohesion is the level of emotional bonding extent and nature of connection, boundaries, and shared interests within the family. It is the balance between family members' independence and their togetherness. Uh, when there is too much closeness, this results in the members being enmeshed. When there is too much separate, separate, separatedness, it results in disengagement due to emotional cutoff, and the family members are just focused on personal interests and least community, uh, commitment to family interests. Members are unable to turn to each other for emotional or, practic or practical support. Therefore, family members need to be separated yet connected, where we say one uh, I is equal to we. 
when there is an imbalance, the environment is ripe for family dysfunction to, to thrive, whereby members take up pseudo roles like the scapegoat, a hero, lost child, and a mascot just in order to survive. And this is how deep seated conflicts are given room to grow and to develop. In fact, as per the psychoanalytic theory approach, family conflicts are rooted in early childhood uh, experiences. Why am I talking about family conflict? Because family is the bedrock of any society and family life is, very, is a very important system and the very first uh, institution to exist in humanity. SGD 16 promotes the use, uh, promotes peace, justice, and strong institution, whereas SGD 10 talks about reduced inequality and SGD 5 about gender equality, uh, where it uh, strives to achieve gender equality and power on women and girls by taking reforms to give women equal rights to economic resources as well as access to ownership and control over land and other forms of property. Communication is a facilitative skill and has the potential to support family members to move to functional levels of flexibility and cohesion. And the skilled use of listening to hear and understand all parties demonstrates respect. To be able to resolve family conflict, the family members have to be flexible, flexibly connected or structurally uh, separated. During conflict, uh, conflict or dispute, family members are normally entrenched in their positions and as a skilled mediator, one needs to explain that the situation does not have to be in black or white and demonstrate how incremental changes can be helpful by use of set of skills like open-ended questions, uh, shuttle diplomacy where there is power imbalances or where two parties, two family members cannot agree to sit in the same room together. During uh, caucuses, the mediator can do some reality testing to get to know what their best alternative, their worst alternative or the most, um, the most uh, likely alternative to the negotiated uh, agreement will be getting to know what are the real needs, what are the interests of these parties. And if then the mediator, a skilled mediator can provide clues on how uh, individual actions are likely to bring results by visibly illustrating the gray areas that lie between the simple consideration of balanced power. The, mediator, the skilled mediator can support the family members to move closer to optimal flexibility and cohesion. When one of them changes, show them how, when one of them changes, it will affect the others. A result, as a result of which, conflicts will be minimized to result in, uh, family, uh, in healthier family relationship. Therefore, by the use of communication as a key facilitative skill, mediation offers a bridge to the other side of family conflict in a very professional, dignified, and, and uh, amicable way, which lawyers or ad advocates are not able to do in litigation that follows a court process, which is open to the public, exposing family secrets with winners and losers as the outcome, and not addressing the family relationship, making the rift in the family even widen more. Uh, as you recall, uh, in one of the dailies, uh, this made headlines where one of the siblings, out of six siblings, went to court uh, to sue the other siblings, and uh, the legal fees was a whopping 368 million. And this was a succession court uh, case, and this would have been solved in an amicable way in a mediation setup, as opposed as to going to, to court. So the question was, I was asking myself, could this sibling be the hero in the family, thinking that I need to rescue my family? And instead of maybe thinking mediation, they thought uh, the best way is uh, for me to take this issue to court. That is a question for you, ladies and gentlemen, just to pause and think about. Article 159 of the Constitution of Kenya aims at easing 
uh, uh, easing access to justice through the use of reconciliation, mediation, and traditional conflict resolution mechanisms. It is essential that a party not only accesses justice, but feels satisfied by the outcome at the psychological level. A party must be able to have their feelings of anger, recognition, uh, uh, their, uh, their feel, sorry, their feelings of anger, recognition, satisfaction, and sense of justice addressed. Therefore, uh, skilled mediators have the capacity to restore a party's hopes, dreams, and self-confidence. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how mediators do build uh, a bridge or bridges during the mediation process as they use the professional set of skills step by step until they arrive at a self-determinant uh, settlement agreement or a partial agreement, or sometimes they do not settle. But through the process and using the set, uh, the set skills, they are able to, breathe, uh, to build bridges. Mediation is then encouraged a lot. There was in the dailies on 16th of uh, August, 2021, the judiciary did settle cases uh, uh, valued at 14 billion out of court in the last five, uh, five, uh, five years. And 5,218 out of 9,057 were resolved through mediation helping parties avoid lengthy and costly uh, proceedings. In her remarks, Chief Justice Martha Kome emphasized that mainstreaming alternative mechanisms for assessing justice was a key pillar to her vision for the judiciary. So ladies and gentlemen, I end my presentation there as I wait to hear from uh, uh, Susan. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I, I, I'm going to say um, you'll know this, of course, because you're you framed this very much as a talk. So, you know, with and so the kinds of things that you're opening with the London Bridge discussion and, and such um, resonate really well when you're speaking to people and are a really good frame for, for talking. You might want to in turning it into a paper that that people are simply going to read to think about what you might want to do around um, that metaphor of bridges, because uh, it won't be quite the same likely um, the way you frame it, because you won't be telling your own personal story in quite the same way in a paper kind, kind of setting. Um, I, I, I would also say um, you've got a couple of different kinds of pieces going on and they're both, they both have the potential if it's a long enough paper to be built out but that you might want to think about placing your focus um, on the second part of what you're talking about, which when you're digging into um, how in a family different kinds of, of conflicts emerged that, or, and you, you started at the beginning with some of them are entrenched and long-term and generational, um, but talking about maybe a, a more specifically focusing on those. And I say that um, because I think your audience, when you're talking about, um, you know, where mediation can be used in these, is going to be people who are more familiar with some of the things that you're, you're talking about, about how the family is defined and what that looks like, and less familiar with the second part of what you're talking about, um, or how those kinds of conflicts that emerge can actually be, be dealt with in mediation. So I, I think you might do well to kind of place more emphasis there. Um, and I guess the, the other piece I was gonna say is I just purely ending, um, I, I don't, don't think that you needed to go into the discussion about um, you know, what's happening in the courts or the potential for litigation, um, except maybe in the most passing way that it is another option. Because I think you had more than enough to talk about just in terms of the way you were talking about the mediation piece and just encourage you to, you to, to really for the paper, pick a focus and, and stick with that as much as you can, because I think it'll be, uh, it'll, it'll just be uh, more persuasive that way. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Susan. I've, I've taken note of the comments and I'm really encouraged. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, 
Thank you for your presentation, Brigitte uh, Grace Fairimo and uh, Dr. Sharon for your remarks. Uh, we invite uh, Medita Caroline Manjiko Njuguna to make up her, her presentation. Her fellowship topic is conflicts in family systems. Her fellowship topic is conflicts in uh, family systems. Um, so uh, Caroline Manjiko. Caroline Wanjiko. Okay, uh, Caroline Wanjiko Njuguna, we are not able to hear you or to see you. And so we will proceed, we will proceed on to the next category of uh, presentations. Um, so for this category also, uh, Medita uh, Majorimburu uh, is not, um, uh, we've uh, not been able to hear her uh, presentation on uh, um, Medita Majorimburu on uh, good health and well-being in uh, mediation. And so with that, uh, uh, Dr. Sharon, we have concluded the first category of our presentations. And uh, these are the presentations uh, uh, by the colleagues who have submitted uh, a feature written article. And this was a submission of 1,000 to 1,200 words. And in essence, it opens the uh, opportunity for the peers to be able to advance on to the journal publication journey with uh, the fellowship guide, uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, Peter Mbaru. And uh, now we move to the next category, which is the blog style, uh, the written articles. These were the five the submissions uh, with uh, 500 words. So for this uh, category, you will make your presentation for three minutes. And uh, we invite you to kindly keep to the three minutes time. Um, you have your paper uh, and the, this is speaking, so you need to determine you, or you determined already um, uh, what you're going to present to us so that it keeps to the um, three minutes. And uh, with that, we will be starting off uh, with uh, mediator uh, Pauline Wahinya. And uh, mediator Pauline Wahinya, your paper is on uh, the conflict transformation within the banking industry in Kenya the glaring error in handling of employee-related uh, fraud. Uh, uh, mediator, Pauline Wahinya, welcome. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Ah, it's good afternoon. morning for Sharon. How are you, everyone? Um, my paper was on the glaring area of the banking industry in Kenya. And I had said earlier, because I am a, um, I'm a banker of many years, over 25 years in, in banking industry. And I would want to quote the father of capitalism. We call him the Adam Smith, who started capitalism, a, a, a philosophy of capitalism. And mm. banking industry is driven by capital. And it is, um, we call the, 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 the economy is driven by that, by the private sector. And that is how they really dwell on, uh, on capital. Therefore, as a banker, I could see so many challenges where many of people we uh, ever worked in that industry have, have many challenges because of uh, there is money and the fraud is very, very common in the banking industry. And because they are the, the bank are the capital owner, they are driven by that interest of capital and the demand of capital. So my question was, there was no human touch in this. And lack of human touch is you don't care about your, your employee. And I wondered, how can we bring this? Because you cannot avoid fraud, but you can bring harmony between the employee and the employer. Then we see, how can this employer, even if there will be a fraud in this industry, how can we harmonize? So that the employee who have worked for many years is going home um, uh, without any pay, empty-hearted, that's what we call 
And then the, the, the employer has no that empathy or feeling like I need to do something and investigate into this matter instead of dismissing this employee who have worked for this organization for many years and he has built the he has built the um, the organization or grown with the organization and you the banks are known to report very huge profit at the end of every year then how are you dealing with your staff so that the relationship between this person the employee and the employer it is really harmonized and it is um, it is it is not bad and it is not it's good as i live because of a certain uh, error i'm going home knowing the employer has worked well with me or the employer has um, has tried their best in the investigation and i'm not just sent home empty hearted that is my my fellowship topic i wanted to bring mediation into this fraud areas of employee employer in the banking industry which is very common in this and as i look at uh, uh, number seven number eight of sdgs it is to give sustainable goal decent work and economic growth so when you are doing this and i'm an employer you are not building the, the economy of your nation because sdg as we want to achieve them in 2030 it is to give every individual decent work and economic growth. So what I am trying to do in this paper is to make sure you are not just ready to go without, you know, to be on the street without a job and without maybe making a mistake. Majority of people are, like, are in, in prison because of the mistake they have not done, because there is so much money which change hands in the banking industry. That is why I am saying uh, mediation will be the only solution. Mediation is, a, is, is it is the, 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 the only solution to for a peaceful and, and prospect interest of the banking and, the, and, and for the long play dismissed employee in Kenya. So if we bring mediation, both parties will be able to enhance a good relationship and to have that um, to have that human touch in everything we do as employer or the employer uh, should have that uh, that human heart and we care about the human resource in our organization that is how this paper would like to bring it up and the problem the challenge i've seen is lack of awareness of mediation in that in the industry or in the banking industry and uh, the, again, the challenge is opportunity to dismiss the employee without a pay. Therefore, this is not a good thing and lack of proper investigation by the employer. And we put our employee into a big agony and they go home. People disgruntled, others even die. It is not a simple matter because it costs life. Thank you very much, Shalom. And that is the way I would like to bring this and to improve this paper. It can be used in an organization. In Kenya, we have um, an association of bankers. And in that basis, I can be able to bring it and I talk to the chair and the, because all the bankers in that association, we bring sense into it through awareness. And we see, we bring the touch of the, the touch of the human human touch, human capital, how important it is as for us and as employers. Thank you very much. Wangari, I may have passed three minutes. Thank you, Shalon. Yeah, Th thank you very much. Um, I, I, I appreciate you saying where you would like to take it because as a banker, one of the things that you're talking about that I think will be that you want to do is think about the audience that you're writing to. And it sounds to me like, you want this to be something that can be distributed to other bankers um, so that so there will be things that you don't need to mention that they'll understand because they already know um, that it's common to have these different frauds that it's, you know, so you won't need to focus on things that they know what you'll want to, to be talking about, I think, 
is probably um, it, it falls into a category of the kinds of things that get mediated where there's a breach of trust. And there's a bit of an assumption that, that that's criminal, so you couldn't do it, um, right? The same kinds of things that you heard Steve talking about having to address if you, know, you were going to have mediation in, in a criminal context. I think those will be some of the questions they'll have too that you'll want to you'll want to really talk about why it helps um, the bank um, to actually do that and and I think you're getting at it with some of the relationship and, and value of it things um, but you may want to have a quick look at some of the kinds of work that has been done around um, the importance of rebuilding relationships in workplace situations with breach of trust because that is an, an area where there has been lots of mediation around the world in that employee space, less in specific banking fraud ones. But I think you can really draw on that. And I, I like that you're focusing on your audience. I think that will be really helpful for framing what do they need to know. You probably don't need to talk to everybody else who's doing who's who needs to know about mediation, just what a bankers need to know, which makes it nice. <laughs> So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Shapon. Thank you. I will do that. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, our next uh, presenter in the collection of blog style written articles is uh, Mediator Sela Ruto. Uh, Mediator Sela Ruto's topic is uh, introducing community mediation to the grassroots a case study of integration of professional mediators in the chief's office in Kipkaren salient location, Nandi County in Kenya. Uh, welcome, Mediator Fela. Uh. <coughs> Hi, everybody. Hi, Mediator Okay, my name is Mediator Sela Ruto. My fellowship topic is introducing community mediation in the grassroots through the chief's office in the current Salian location in Nandi County in Kenya. In every community in the world, there are several types of wrangles and issues that are prevalent and at times unique to the area. Community mediation is one of the ways to solve such disputes. This form of mediation would be useful and works for people of different ages and backgrounds. In addition to saving money, time, and preservation of relationships, mediation gives the participants an opportunity to develop their own solutions that work for them rather than relying on an outsider without a future interest in the outcomes to make it a judgment for them. So people who have been in wrangles, when they come up with their own solution, they'll be able to retain their relationships. Nandi County, is one of the 47 county governments in Kenya. It has a population of 884,711 people and an area of 2,884 square kilometers. On the other hand, the current salient location in Nandi County is part of the national government administrative offices that is on the ground 
or grassroots. And he's headed by a chief who is well recognized and as an authoritative government official within the community. TV service coordinates government officials and also maintains security for the community. In the current salient location, land is held with a very high importance within the community. These are rising from rich agricultural productivity as one of the nation's food basket counties. And in recent times, due to commercial interests, commercial land buying and selling and subdivision of the family land is one rampant issues which causes disagreements and conflicts between the community members. Community members consult with the chief's office as their nearest government administrative office when disagreements arise. Chief's office handles several issues. To touch a few, domestic uh, violence is one of them. Land issues, that is leasing and buying and also boundary disputes. Therefore, in the creation of professional mediators at the chief's office would enable the community to access professional services, since mediators apply cardinal rules, which influence their practical work, being effective listeners and neutral, thus resulting in productive interaction during mediation, strengthening of the family members' relationships and in a harmonious community and togetherness. Thank you. Sai Siri, that's goodbye in Galenjin. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it, I was I was gonna say there's you've got some really interesting pieces there and that I would um I, I would encourage you to, to think about who the audience is, because I think there's a couple different possible audiences for this one. And that would that would change which parts you would place focus on. Um, but one thing that does strike me is when I hear your your title and you use the word case study, that to me means something that might be different than it means to you, because I think a case study is when it's already been done. Um, and that you're already so that it's already there. So you're going to tell us about something that has already started there. And so what you're telling us about is how to start it. So you might want to think about your title. Um, that may be just me. That may that might be a North American thing that that's how we understand case studies. So my apologies if that's not accurate for others. But just depending on the audience, that makes me think you've already done it and already got all the mediation there. Um, but I would say I, I'm really interested when you start into um, the conversation about the types of disputes. And it was interesting to hear you talking about the commercial, that there's commercial disputes, that there's domestic violence disputes. Um, and I, it would be really interesting to hear a little bit more about those and how they, they play out in the community. Like, what, what did, how do they get to? that particular place to be resolved, um, but really interesting. And I think that I would encourage you to focus there on those types of disputes and uh, and share, share some ideas about really specifically, a land dispute might look like this, a domestic violence dispute might look like this, because people will think of them very differently and, and might not understand how the two of them fit together and have the same fit with mediation. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharon, uh, for the input. 
I will I will do something about it. Thank you so much. Yes. Well, th well, thank you. I enjoyed I enjoyed hearing it, Sela. It was it was great to listen to. Okay, thank you. Uh, and um, so, uh, Dr. Sharon, you kindly um, allow us to be able to handle um, two of the two of the feature articles, uh, uh, sesh, uh, two of the feature articles that were yet to were yet to be presented. So we we will start off with. Uh, uh, mediator Caroline Wanjikonjuguna on the fellowship topic of conflicts in family systems, and then go back also to uh, mediator Marjorie Jimboro on uh, good health and well being um, in mediation. And so, with that, uh, we have uh, Caroline Wanjiko, if you may kindly uh, make your presentation. Okay, thank you so much for the chance. And um, my apologies, I wasn't able to come in earlier. So my mind was about conflicts in family systems. In uh, why conflicts in family systems? Because with my experience in mediation, I've dealt with a lot of families. Mediator Caroline, if I yes, may, please. Um, if yes. you may kindly uh, set your video, we are not able to. Uh, we can hear you well. Oh, okay. Um, sorry for that. Thank you. Am I visible now? Yes. Welcome. All right. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, I, I picked conflict in family systems, of conflict in, in, in family systems, and we see family is a background of our institutions rather than the country itself. And I feel that there's a lot of conflict that people are going through, and I've dealt with that. So I would start as a conflict is one of a healthy sign, not necessarily have to be a negative process. And uh, conflict uh, reflects dynamics in family systems and also in family structures. And that uh, with conflict, basically it makes us be more aware of the problems within our relations that need to be solved. Because sometimes we, we in family systems or rather in our family structures, we get into a comfort zone because we've already established a family and it makes us uh, be comfortable whereby we forget that we need to continue improving on our family. Now, there are times when things need change and when new skills need to be learned and when habits need to be modified so that we avoid or we, we limit the instances where conflict can come up or arise. Now, conflicts energize and increase motivations to deal with problems. And it helps you understand what you are like a person in regards to a family structure. What makes you angry, definitely. What frightens you, what is important to you, and how much you tend to manage your, your conflicts in a family setup, an individual, and regardless of a family setup. Now, conflicts can be fun when they're not taken too seriously and conflicts can depend and enrich our relationship depending on the way uh, we perceive the conflict in the family structure. Now, conflict makes it life more interesting. When people disagree with your ideas, it may interest you in finding out more about the issues. However, this is not much as we look at our family system. We don't take time to be interested in why somebody is not agreeing with our ideas. We tend first to go into a defense system or into a defense mode and uh, after you've defended the, the amount of peace that has remained in an individual, then later on when uh, you've defended yourself is when probably you have a mindset of sitting down and trying to question why someone disagreed with your idea. Now, uh, families have undergone conflicts through since time in memorial, as I can remember, and some family conflicts have escalated and are in the public domain where everybody can see families in conflict, while others have been silently spoken of. Some families uh, do not talk about their conflicts uh, because of maybe of their cultural background or what are their perspectives about conflict and family cohesion. So they prefer having their conflict silently spoken within the, the, the immediate family or just within the family members that are important. So um, we could, I want us to look at how family units are built. Uh, they're built in cycles, so that people to understand in every stage of a family system, there's always a possible conflict presenting itself. One stage is beginning family, whereby beginning family, this is where we have a couple who have just married, they're establishing their home, but do not yet have children. So their task here is basically establishing a satisfying home and a marriage 
and relationship and preparing for children. At this stage, if they're not able to develop well the family in terms of their goals of the family, individual goals and also uh, goals of a couple, then most likely you'll find that conflict will erupt in that their goals are not, um, they're not in line with uh, individual goals. So individual goals and couple goals should be in line so that they avoid conflict. Otherwise, there'll be a conflict, uh, a conflict will arise. Instead, too, we have children bearing family. This is a stage where now the family is birth of the first child until the, the, the child is around two and a half years old. Now, again here, when a child comes in the family, there is attention. One, there is attention uh, between you as a couple and there's attention for the child. As this part, the couples are adjusting to increase the increasing of family size caring for an infant, providing a positive developmental environment for each one of you individually, and also as a couple, and of course, as new parents. So if you do not transition well in this task in childbearing family, then they'll be out of strain individually and also as a couple. And through a strain, everybody will try their best to, of course, work, in, um, work towards having their own kids and maintaining the best that they have on, on their own individual. So it will put a strain as couples, and of course, it might spill over to the children who innocently need care. We have stage three, where you have family with preschoolers. Uh, this is where the oldest child is between maybe the age of two and a half to six, and they're going to the, the beginning school. The task here is to satisfy the needs and the interested, the needs and interests of the preschool children. Basically, the children need to cope with the new environment from home. And then, of course, coping with demands one energy with less privacy at home. Now, of course, um, when there are couples, only two of them, there are no children. So the privacy was more explicit. And like now, when the children are coming in and there is no much of a privacy as a couple. So it can be challenging if they do not transition well in terms of having children who are going to school and the needs of the children who are now uh, going to school, they are having a new environment and they're having new, uh, new to learn new things about caring and sharing from other people. Now, uh, family with school children, when the oldest child is between the age of six to 13, the task here as a family is promoting educational achievement and fitting in with the community or families with school age children. What is the challenge at this particular point? One is that we have attention seeking behavior from the children. Of course, we have identity crisis because it's the age where they need to identify with their age set, with their age group, identify to where they belong, and it can also be challenging for them. Of course, um, if these challenges are transitioned well with the children and also the family itself goes through these challenges successfully, then the rewards are adjustments. They get to be adjusted. You can see they're self-adjusted. And as a family also, they are well adjusted. Now we have stage five, that is family with teenagers. Family with teenagers, that is the oldest child is between 13 to 20 years. The task here as a family is allowing and helping children to become more independent, coping with their independence, developing new interests beyond childcare. Now, specifically this age, this is the age where the teenagers are changing from a child to an adolescent, a young adult, or an adolescent who now has to start making decisions on their own instead of depending much of their parents. There are also changes in their body that is psychological and of course biological. And at this stage, you find a lot of uh, teenagers trying to find a sense of belonging and to identify with a clique of groups they tend to look at their parents to identify with their fathers and try with their mothers. But if there's no good transition from their parents, then you'll find that the, the children are likely to follow up on what they're getting in schools. That's why now currently probably in Kenya, we have the unrest of students because of how they're being transitioned into adulthood. So uh, at this stage also, we find a lot of family conflicting because of behavior of our teenagers, yet, uh, we fail to understand is that they are seeking to understand, they're seeking for identity, to be told that whatever is happening to you at the moment 
it is normal for the changes and that you'll go through it. They're seeking to be told that this is what's happening, this is the stage they're going through and all this happens. Now, at this stage, we find a lot of couples, a lot of families actually split or rather separate uh, because of uh, blame, the blame yes. game, whereby you blame one uh, one party or rather your, your, uh, either the mother or the father blames of not taking care of the children in terms of behavior. And eventually uh, you get to see the father has been misbehaving probably in alcoholism. You would find the mother saying like father like son or rather, where have you been? So most people get frustrated at this stage because they need to change their children behavior. And then we have launching that is six, stage six. From the time the oldest child leaves the family for independent adult life till the time the last child leaves, that is launching stage. What is the task at this stage? It is releasing young adults and accepting new ways of relating to them, maintaining a supportive home base, adapting to the new living circumstances. Now, these children have left home. They have gone to live their own life. Uh, the couple, again, has to accept the, the ways of relating with them because it's not going to be the same as the earlier stages. And again, you have to, as a family system, again, you have to maintain a supportive home base for the children. In any case, if they leave there out in the future and then they find it's not the best, they will always come back to re-energize themselves, to learn new things, to find solace. And now the couple have to adapt into the new living circumstances whereby the children have gone. There were two, then we had the children come in, raise the children, now the children have gone back gone out of the world now the couple is coming back as two again we have empty nest that is stage seven from the time the children are gone till the marital couple retires from employment now renewing and redefining the marriage relationship at this stage the task of course is again maintaining ties with children and their families and preparing for retirement Again, this is a part where I normally pick it as quite uh, sensitive, especially for the couples and also for the family who have not be, been prepared for transitioning, especially for retirement. You find that is when the elderly would go on a rampant, as if they've gone back to being teenagers who are on the rampant uh, era of doing things just to soothe a wound that they are not psychologically prepared for either retirement. Now, in this regard, when it comes to the conflicts, you find um, one spouse uh, would, would, uh, would accuse the other spouse uh, in regards to how they're behaving. For example, I'll give a very good example. In Kenya, we have the teacher serving uh, commission, whereby if someone has been a teacher and you've retired, there's a pension scheme. And then, uh, and then we have the man who worked in the hotel industry, and uh, it was a private hotel industry and there was no pension or anything, just the last payment. So when you go back to the uh, home where the, now they are retired, you find that the man probably would feel that the woman is looking down upon him because she's providing, she's having money, but the man has to probably depend on the wife uh, for getting the month, uh, the daily uh, fee or monthly stipend for him to survive or do his errands. So definitely here, there's a, uh, we can say it's a red spot for, of course, conflict in the family system, which leads even to um, to suicides or even homicides or even uh, even uh, psychological maladaptive behaviors that can bring conflict in the family. We have stage eight, which is aging family from retirement till the death of the surviving marriage partner. The task here is adjusting to retirement, coping with the death of the marriage partner and life alone. At this stage also transitioning in terms of aging also is very crucial because at times we've seen where other family members come in and interfere when one party has uh, passed on, especially if the man has passed on, you'll probably find um, either the family members who are extended from the, uh, the husband's side coming in and claiming uh, wealth. Alternatively, we find your own children trying to
It looks like you're muted. Um, uh, Dr. Sharon, uh, if, if we may kindly uh, request you to give us your, your remarks uh, based on the presentation that has been given that far, I, I believe that we have the essence of, uh, of, of the topic. Of the topic. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Caroline Wanjiko, for your presentation. Dr. Sharon, kindly. Yeah, I mean, I, Carolina, I would, I, I, it's very interesting to, to um, hear you talking about the different uh, presumptions around um, what happens where the conflict is at different stages in the family. Um, and, uh, and I think what I would encourage you to do is think about who is the audience for this particular um, message, because it, it's, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking that the, the people who might want to hear it are people who are actually new mediators, who that might be useful learning or thinking for them if they're thinking about going into family mediation. Um, and that that's probably the, the audience that would take this, this kind of description and be able to um, think about and have conversations arising from it around what would mediation look like in those contexts and if that's the case if that's somewhere that that you think that that would end up being read and used um, then just have that in mind as you're doing it so that you're um, allowing them to to make those kind of linkages because um, i yeah i think that would be something that I would just encourage you to think about um, who who's going to be reading this and what are they going to want to take from it because it's very much focused on on this this evolution of different types of family conflicts. And it is very interesting. So, so thank you. You're on mute, my Gary. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Caroline Wanjiko, I see that you were speaking. If, uh, did you have uh, some uh, words, some comments? Um, I just wanted to top up something small, but if it's still time, I can do it, of course, with your permission. Okay, is that one minute so that we can proceed? One minute, kindly. Okay, um, I just want to say that uh, in terms of family conflict, what I've picked on also, it has affected our youth in regards we find it that it has led to a rising of single parenthood, increase of family violence, and of course, relation problems in adolescence. With a case that I'm looking at is that I have an adolescent or a teenager who turned into uh, lesbianism because the father figure was not there or what they had seen is that the father has been very violent to the mother. So the, the, the girl decided to become a lesbian in terms of a father figure to protect other ladies from violence, which I feel conflict should be dealt with that we're able to also prevent it from spillage in our children. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Caroline, for your, your, your presentation, uh, Caroline Anjiko for your presentation, and also uh, Dr. Sharon for your, um, your remarks um, or to the presentation. Uh, we were uh, inviting mediator Marjorie Mb uh, Jimburu for our topic on good health and well-being in mediation. I am not sure that I see her um, still back in. Um, the Next presentation, uh, uh, feature, uh, art, uh, sorry, a blog article is uh, from Phyllis Elaine Mangwe on mediation in access to justice. And uh, I also uh, uh, do not see her uh, present um, here. That is her topic. The next, so the next presentation will, is um, uh, Christine Diloka Kema, the topic of opening a mediation office in Tarakanithi County in Kenya. Uh, Christine Ndilo Kakema on opening a mediation office in Tarakaniti County. Welcome, Christine Kakema. Hello, thank you so much. I think you can hear me. I'm Christine, a psychologist. 
working in Darakadipe County, Kenya, Chipa Rivaro Hospital. I'm also uh, uh, Christine, uh, Christine, yes. if you may. Christine, if you may, you kindly speak louder and uh, we are not able to see you. Hello, if, yes. you can yes. hear me now? Yes, okay. yes, yes. Please, yeah, yeah. Thank you, you very much. Can also welcome. see me? Yes, welcome. Okay, I say it, I'm Christine Kachema from Tarakaniti County, Kenya. I'm a psychologist and a technologist working in Chukariparo Hospital. Uh, my fellowship topic is opening a mediation office in Barakanidi County. A short description is establishment of a mediation office in Barakanidi County, Kenya, to enable people assess dispute conflict with the East. A short introduction of Barakanidi, because I'm aware most of them don't know where Barakanidi is. Barakanidi is a uh, in Kenya, it borders between Embu and, the, uh, and the Meru County. The, we do farming and horticulture. We plant coffee, tea, and uh, many other crops. The population is 393. And uh, in Chuka town, which is the main town in Darakaniti, there is no any mediation office. The farthest mediation office is in Embu, which is a bit far for people to travel. Now, why do I need this mediation office in Darakaniti? One, the purpose actually is to be site for mediation numbers which where mediators can manage to do cases, where mediators can keep their files, where mediators will cooperate the 100 trained mediators in Tarakaniti, and it will also be a site to support development of mediators association. It will also be a center for consultancy for anybody with a mediation case, which will give a lot of privacy. What are the key considerations? Finances, marketing, and the approach of setting up mediation office is writing a proposal to the county government of Tarakaniti, write proposals to non-governmental organizations, train government officials who will post as mediation ambassadors in their in their offices in their offices use the site as a center for training mediators and mentoring them and doing continuous professional developments make the mediation office as a link to the office of judiciary and even to the mediation accreditation committee within the Rakaniti. What are the main challenges which I have gone through? One, just a minute. Sorry. The challenges are <laughs> lack of funds to pay office rent, lack of exposure of mediators who are not sure on how to expose themselves. Three, mediation is not yet known in Tarakaniti County, Kenya. Hence, it's not easy to reach the community. Very few knows mediation exceeds. In my conclusion, because I don't want to take long because of my three minutes, I request mediators, let's wake up. Let's help the community. Let's open offices in every, every county to help people with conflicts. Let people know 
mediation exceeds. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I know that you were cutting things short because of the timing. Um, so if this is something you were thinking about anyway, then then I, you know, I apologize. You may you may already be thinking about it. Um, but one of the things when I hear you talking about smaller communities and placing mediation offices in them, then one of the things you might want to think about, whether it's for this article or whether it's for the actual business plan that comes out, is how much work is there for mediators and how do how do they manage to sustain themselves especially as they're starting that process so um it, it sounds like you're giving some thought to those kinds of things too but one of the things we run into problems with here is often trying to get a sustainable practice going and often it simply is the size of the community as you're building it can be really really challenging so it, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on that as you as you're developing what you're looking at specifically for the business plan, though, even more than the article. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, uh, Christine uh, Kakema for uh, your topic uh, and presentation of, uh, of your topic and uh, Dr. Sharon for your uh, remarks. Uh, we have uh, the other article from uh, Mediator Patricia Oketch uh, on uh, the impact of grief on uh, mediation. I do not um, see mediator Patricia Ketch in the session. Uh, in addition, um, Ma um, uh, Margaret Gatia, uh, whose fellowship topic is a case of children in family mediation. Um, then uh, the other uh, person that we have is uh, Felista Marura Musili, PhD, uh, with a fellowship topic on, uh, uh, on uh, emotion, stress, and burnout in uh, mediators. And so, yes, we have the blog article. And uh, the other person is um, Asia Kamukama, whose uh, fellowship topic is mediation in the workplace for startups, uh, transforming team leaders into conflict ninjas, the untapped income opportunity for mediators. Um, I believe that now we can proceed to the next uh, 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 fellow who is here. And uh, that is uh, Njeri Njao with a fellowship topic, trauma-informed mediation. Uh, like keep here for peace. Uh, Jerry and Joe. Jerry and Joe. Okay. Uh, we proceed on to our next um, uh, person, and that is uh, Joyce Kingori with a fellowship topic, Resolving Child Custody Disputes Through Mediation. Resol that is uh, Resolving Child Custody Disputes Through uh, Mediation, uh, Joyce Kingori. Joyce Kingori, you are able to speak. Yeah, yes. Welcome, Joyce Kingori. We can see you and I believe we can hear you. Welcome. Hey, like it has been mentioned, my, my name is Joyce Kingori. I truly love mediation. Uh, my topic is child custody mediation. Uh, and it's a process in which parents work together to develop a plan for parenting their child or children after divorce, separation, or even where there was no marriage but the child was born. Most importantly, it is to help the disputed parents to clearly define the issues at hand. That's the work of the mediator and the importance of having a mediation in the children, in the children matter, and especially in the area of child custody and co-parenting. The underlying interest, the underlying interest and the needs versus the wants of the parents by the needs of the child. It's very crucial for the parties to explore what might work with the child at the center of it all in every conversation or in every dispute. The decision is to be made, the decisions to be made must be at all times be child-centered. Either the plans for the future, child custody, where the child will stay, where they will go to school, who they are going to reside with, are they going to be brought up in the urban or in the rural area? 
parents is going to be involved and auntie and uncle, the grandparents, all those things must come to play. And they must all, all be in the interest of the children. And so if there is an area that there must never be a winner, it is when it comes to child custody. The child must be the ultimate winner. Fighting over child custody issues in court can intensify the pain for all those involved, not to mention the expenses. Fortunately, disagreeing couples can get help working towards the solutions from somewhere else other than the court, and that is in mediation. Child custody mediation exists precisely so that parents who just can't seem to agree don't have to take on the financial and emotional cost of court battle. Child custody mediation is designed to help divorcing or unmarried parents to reach an agreement on legal and physical custody in the lives of their children. Legal relates to who will make the decisions regarding the important matters in child life, such as education, religion, uh, bringing medical bills, and the physical and physical is all about where the child will primarily reside. The guiding principle again is what is what is the best interest of the child or the children. Children custody, uh, uh, child custody and co-parenting are often the most emotionally charged and difficult and difficult uh, mediations, especially because it brings along other family members who probably have all taken sides. And they cannot rationally negotiate with one another. It's only in mediation that hostility can be toned down and everyone is properly heard. I find child custody mediation safe, easier, and mostly works best where the attorneys don't, don't try to battle it out together with the parties and they allow them to make their own decisions. Mediation can keep very rough patches, but the best way to remind the parties is that the focus is on the children. Marital issues also cloud the process most of the time, and that has been very, very difficult to help the parties to differentiate. Are they trying to work out their, their relationship? Are they trying to change to each other, or are they talking about their children? When carrying out mediation, these matters must be clarified early enough so that we may know we are dealing only with child custody and nothing else. In mediation, one of the things in child mediation, the most important thing to look out for has there been physical abuse, emotional abuse towards the children. And that must be dealt with even before you go on to talk about where the child will live and who is going to take custody and how the parenting will go about. Uh, virtual, virtual mediation in children sometimes becomes very difficult because there are cases that you need to see the children physically and, this, and help them to decide who is a better parent, enabling them to understand that there is, there is a part of a mother and a father, but where they cannot be able to live together and bring up this child, then the best way is to go their different way, but they allow the child to grow holistically in, a, in an environment where he or she is safe. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I have a little bit of trouble with sound once in a while on yours, so I apologize if that affects what I have to say. Um, I, I think that you did a really nice job in terms of, of the focus on things that are child-centered and what that means and how one, um, you know, and making the case for ensuring that what always stays it focused on the best interests of the children and figuring out what that looks like. Um, I don't think you need to, unless you were going to do something longer or, or for a different audience, go into too many of the things like going into virtual mediation, going into um, concerns around, um, around potential for having had abuse or violence. Um, and the reason I say that, they're really important topics but I think they're big whole topics of their own. And that um, that if you were going to talk about things like, you know, any kind of abuse that occurred, if you're talking about child centered, that would mean that you're going to have to talk about abuse. 
but if you're going to talk, but it's such a big topic by itself that I think it's separate. I think you need to talk about it and, and, and have all of it be about abuse, if that's the case, because there's so many issues that relate to how you deal with that if in a mediation. Um, and, and maybe just assume that it's kind of included if you're talking about child centered and ch best interests of the child that you'd need to have that conversation. So I, I just I, I'll raise it that way, just because in this context, you might want to just really, really focus on that on what is child centered look like, because I think you do a really good job of, of focusing in on that. Yeah, thank you. So th thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Joyce Kingwari, for your topic and also for your for your presentation. And um, at the, we move on to the next uh, colleague, and this is uh, mediator Cecilia Naliaka. Uh, her fellowship topic is on the place of confidentiality in uh, online uh, mediation. The place of confidentiality in uh, online uh, mediation. And so, welcome. Good um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cecilia Naliaka. I'm an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and a certified professional mediator. My topic, my fellowship topic is the place of confidentiality in online mediation. Mediation is negotiation with the assistance of a third party known as the mediator. The primary function of the mediator is to help facilitate conversation between two parties and to help the parties come to a mutually satisfactory solution. A mediator is therefore required to create an environment where the disputants will be able to express themselves freely. One such way is to ensure there is confidentiality. It is now, a recognized, it is now recognized globally that one of the duties of a mediator is to be confidential. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, it has been difficult to have physical meetings even as the World Health Organization and the Ministry of Health call for a work from home approach. Here in Kenya, we have embraced online classes for university students, online court session, online par parliamentary session, and even online church meetings. The government has asked us to come to terms with the fact that the pandemic is here with us for a longer period. As mediators, we cannot be left behind. We have to equally adopt and embrace online mediation. So how do you attain confidentiality in online mediation, considering that as a mediator, you have no control on who can access the devices of the disputants? Here are some of the ways. The first one is the choice of platform. The first critical aspect is the choice of platform. It could be either Zoom, Teams, Google Meet, or even WhatsApp group call. Through experience, the paid up Zoom is more reliable and gives the host a lot of control. As a mediator, you can disallow recording, place members in rooms for caucus. You also reserve the right to admit members or remove members from the meeting. The second one is use of chat rooms. Before a member can disclose a critical information about the dispute, have them in a private caucus. Let it be you, the mediator and the party, so that in case the information is leaked, you can be able to hold the party accountable. Number three is prepare confidential agreements. Let the parties sign confidentiality agreements with properly drafted clauses on the punishment for breach of the agreement. You could have a penalty fee or require the party in default to perform a certain act. Number four is uh, use a secure internet connection. Public internet or Wi-Fi is prone to hacking and can result to breach of confidentiality. As a mediator, it is crucial to have a secure internet connection. It is also imperative that you explain to the parties the need to have a secure connection. Number five, um, require parties to have their camera on. Let us not forget that as mediators, we observe 
both the verbal communication and nonverbal communication. It is important to ensure the parties have the camera on as this will enable you to see intruders. Alternatively, if there is another person in the room, the party may, may be distracted. In conclusion, we should embrace online mediation as it not only protects our health, but also saves on cost. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I've, got, I've got two things, and I, I know that you're doing a three minute one here. So these may be things that you've already thought about too, but just a couple things that come up for me uh, because I do a lot of online mediation is just we've been increasingly now um, adding one extra thing to the agreement to mediate that we're doing, um, which is especially in relation to Zoom, which is to um, make sure that people are also not broadcasting, not just, you know, so it, it's interesting. There there have been quite a few developments where people are, are turning on the broadcast mechanism. So just, just an extra little thing around confidentiality that I'll throw out there that's coming up. And I don't know if it's coming up in your area or not, but it probably will. Um, but I'll also say, um, I, I, I appreciate why you're saying that it's really valuable and important to be able to see people and the cameras and the values that it brings. But I will, I, I'll just draw your attention to the fact that there are a, a variety of studies um, with programs that do telephone mediation. So they don't see anybody and they run all their mediations with telephones. And so it, that I think I think you're absolutely right that there are circumstances in which being able to see people is key, but you might wanna just think about the ways in which, or, or look into some of the ways in which people actually do the telephone. And, I, and I'm gonna say this just because I used to do mediations in small claims court here. And we actually found that the in-person mediations had a 10% lower settlement rate than our phone mediations. And there were good reasons for that. And it seemed to be a, that actually not seeing people was a benefit in terms of it. Now, very specific type of mediation, very specific topics. But so you just might want to give some thought to where are the places where the concern around the, the seeing people is the most important because it might not be across everything. But I, I do appreciate the point. I think I think you did a great job in terms of identifying some really important issues around confidentiality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cecilia Naliaka, for your presentation. And uh, uh, we now move on to the next uh, presentation, which is Dr. Helen Joroge. On, uh, the, and her topic is the effectiveness of psychological techniques in enhancing uh, dispute resolution. So uh, you are welcome to give your uh, presentation. Yes, uh, we can, thank you, we can see you. You may kindly unmute, thank you. Welcome, Dr. Helen Jaroge. Please proceed. Thank you very much. I have been introduced. My topic has been introduced. And so I'll just go straight. I have three minutes. This paper is going to be developed further. So my topic was um, psychological techniques enhancing mediation, but it's the other way around, mediation enhancing psychological techniques. And let me begin by saying mediation, everyone wins. The new mediation in justice process is mediation. So mediation is a conflict resolution process in which a natural and neutral mediator assists the parties through constructive discussions 
and negotiation of their issues in order to reach a mutually acceptable resolution. This paper will look very closely to the rules, the 10 rules of mediation, because it is those 10 rules of mediation that are rich in psychological techniques to facilitate conflict resolution. And Kenyan courts are flooded with cases with some backlog stretching for many years back, even 90s. The situation keeps worsening as the number of cases fills in Kenyan courts every year exceeds the number of cases that are settled, more than 100,000, causing ever-growing backlog. This backlog leads to injustice and exaggerated legal fees, which add to psychological torture to the involved parties. Mediation is the optimal alternative dispute resolution in realizing justice. And as I said, we will, in the next stage, we will be looking at why mediation is the optimal alternative to, uh, to conflict resolution. The process takes a negotiation approach with the coordination of the assistance of a neutral or third party referred to as a mediator. The disputing parties reach a resolution where they all agree. Mediation helps parties to reach a settlement by assisting with communication. Mediation provides communication opportunity, obtaining relevant information and developing options. And many countries have recorded uh, success rates in mediated cases. Mediation is less costly. Mediation is essential in improving, in improving administration of justice by reducing the huge um, backlog in the courts and the cases and the lengthy days in the hearing and conclusion of court matters. This is why we need mediation because it's short, it's supportive, and it has an extra ability to assess whether the, these parties that have come are of sound mind or do they need another form of support. So mediation is able to provide all that through its mediator. It saves time. Mediation is productive in bringing quicker closure to disputes. It, it, it avoids the continuity of litigation by way of appeals. M mediation is efficient. Mediation is fair. Mediation is neutral. These qualities come about um, in the mediation because mediation is able to give opportunity to listen to people and people come to court because they are conflicted. They didn't have an opportunity to be heard. They did not have an opportunity to express or to deal with their anger, but in mediation, the 10 rules of mediation are very effective at providing an atmosphere or an environment where people can safely sit in confidence and deal with the issues. This is why we should have mediation. It is also informal and it's private. We talk about confidentiality. Mediation process is usually conducted in an informal or private setting. It does not involve the formalities of a courtroom where the litigants 
may have to give sworn evidence and, there's, and be subjected to cross-examination, which causes them a lot of psychological um, trauma. Mediation process provides an emotionally supportive environment for the parties so as to freely express their grievances. It preserves relationships. Mediation provides an opportunity to preserve rather than destroy personal, professional, and business relationships. It increases interpersonal relations and relationships and understanding which comes as a result of the communication and interaction involved. Mediation is effective at, at allowing parties to vent their feelings fully and explores their grievances. The process helps the parties to hammer out a resolution that is suitable, voluntary, and non-binding. It has high it has high compliance rates. Since people are more satisfied with the solutions that they have been mutually and voluntarily agreed to by them than those imposed on them by a judge or other third parties. They tend to comply with the terms and conditions of the agreement. And we cannot leave out the provision of confidential, confidentiality. Mediation is confidential and without prejudice this promotes communication and settlement discussions. It is empowering. It empowers the parties to create solutions. Mediation allows development of creative solutions to all issues important to the parties. It eliminates uncertainties. Mediation eliminates the uncertainty of the decision by a judge or court. Mediation helps to explore the interest underlying the positions taken by the parties. And in conclusion, in, in successful mediation, everyone wins. Everyone involved in a court case should consider mediation as the first option in this process as mediation is cheaper, satisfying, and fair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm going to say, I, I think something that you said at the beginning sounded like it was going to be really, really interesting. And I think that I, I, would, I really want to encourage you to think about um, actually really following up on the, on the piece that... Um, you started with because you you said you were going to actually flip things around and talk about mediation enhancing psych you know and the psychological techniques and kind of that piece of it and you talked about having the 10 rules of mediation and so i was waiting to hear the 10 rules and 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 how they fit with the psychological techniques and i could see how when you were talking about some of the benefits of mediation how maybe just picking the ones that are actually related to what do the psychological techniques do to make them to, you know, to have that benefit. So um, whatever your techniques are, and here's the psychological technique, this is how it, this is why mediation um, might be emotionally supportive. This is why mediation might help build relationships and maybe just ignore the stuff about costs and things like that because they're not really related to the psychological stuff. You, you could say, sure, it's great because people don't lose money and it's cheaper that there's a psychological benefit. But I would say like what you what you started with and you kind of circled back to would be really different than what you might read in some other papers. And so I'd encourage you to really go down that path that you identified, because um, I think that's that's unique. But we do hear like, here's what's good about mediation. If you pick those ones and tie it, 
you'll be doing something that's interesting and different that 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 I haven't seen done in that way. Thank you very much. Um, I'm thinking this is a real learning situation. Uh -huh. and I thank you very much for the critique. And I think that um, you've done an excellent job to steer us back into track so that then we are able to go in, in, in the right direction. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you. This now takes us closer to our opportunity to be able to close uh, the session. And uh, we now invite uh, the next uh, presenter, uh, who is um, uh, Tabitha Wairagu, with the topic Paranoid and Mediation. Uh, the next uh, presentation is uh, Tabitha Wairagu with the topic Paranoid and Mediation. Welcome. Okay, thank you, Wangari. Uh, I have been introduced. Eh? I go straight to the, to the topic. To the topic. What is paranoid? Characteristic of paranoid personality disorder is suspiciousness. We all feel suspicious in certain situations and with certain people often without a good reason. However, paranoid personality people feel suspicious in almost all situations and with almost all people, usually without good reason. For normal people, they go with a reason, but for paranoid people, they go without any reason. They tend to be hypocritical, stubborn, and controlling. If confronted with evidence, they mistrust the person who brought the evidence, who brought the evidence. Paranoid personalities are constantly scanning the environment to support their suspicion. They cannot see their role in the problem or conflict, believing they are always right. Paranoid personalities basically have few friends. Some become very isolated, some paranoid personalities become involved in hostile disputes, which may escalate to lawsuits. They see their difficulties as coming from without rather than from within. And for that, they don't seek help. People with the PPD doubt the commitment, loyalty, or trustworthiness of others, believing others are exploiting or deceiving them. They are reluctant to confide in others or reveal personal information because they are afraid the information will be used against them. They are unforgiving and hold grudges in many cases. People with the PPD become involved in legal battles, suing people they believe are out to get them. They are generally cold and distant in their relationship. With, with others and might become jealousy to avoid being betrayed. A mediation story. A group of people bought a piece of land and in trust, the name of one person member appeared on the certificate. They developed the plot together and started receiving some income. Unfortunately, the member's name appeared on the certificate died. His son, who was a member of the group, secretly transferred the property to himself when others, when another member came to know of his action. They took the matter to court. And all the members, all the parties were invited to the mediation. In mediation, uh, in mediation, in mediation session, the defendant stubbornly refused to talk. It took the intervention of the court officer who finally agreed to communicate. To communicate. After a few sessions, they reached a settlement. The plaintiff 
agreed to withdraw the matter, withdraw the matter from the court and defer the same matter to the elders. During the process, I would ask the defendant to bring the person he trusted to the session, but he brought none. After writing the mediation settlement agreement, he requested me to communicate with his lawyer for confirmation. I did. The lawyer confirmed the correctness of the agreement that the defendant would append his signature to. Meanwhile, the defendant excused himself to get airtime while others were signing. When he took longer than usual, I contacted him only to for only for him to tell me that he had gone home. He therefore declined to sign the agreement without giving any reason. In such a case, the mediator, I the mediator, would have felt frustrated, discouraged, and would have doubt whether one carried the process professional or not. But with the knowledge of such characteristic of paranoid personality disorder, the mediator was calm and patient with that particular party and returned the matter to court for final determination. Psychotherapy is the treatment of choice. Treatment will likely focus on increasing general coping skills, especially trust, empathy, as well as improving interaction, communication, and self-esteem. Focus to remind the focus is to remind the mediators to be calm and patient when dealing with people with paranoid personality disorder because they can be very difficult. Sometimes one can mistake them for drug addicts. Thank you. Thank you. It's interesting to hear you talk through um, a particular instance. It's, it's great to hear you kind of describe what the characteristics are and how they might play out, um, including kind of tying them to the the tendency to be in court which is definitely a, a piece of this um i was going to say one thing you might want to look to if you haven't um is some of the work that bill eddy does on high conflict personalities and i say that i say that um not because he he talks about he doesn't break them down as the personality disorders in quite the same way but one thing that he does do is talk about some of the kinds of things that mediators can do. Um, and you're doing a little bit of that at the end when you were getting into, you know, keep yourself calm, those kinds of things. You might want to just look to um, some of his, his stuff as ideas for um, additional things mediators might do in the face of what he calls high conflict personality disorders. And he's talking about a broader range but I think you'd find many of them quite applicable and, and might be interested in seeing how they fit in with what you're doing. So I definitely encourage you to just add a little bit more that is the specific around what can mediators do? Because that was going a really nice, interesting direction. Yeah. Oh, and I'm not hearing you now, You're, but that's okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Tabitha Wairagu for your presentation and also Dr. Sharon for your uh, remarks um, uh, to uh, following that presentation. Uh, we now invite uh, uh, Mediator Catherine Oroe to conclude our uh, presentations uh, today. And uh, her fellowship topic is on unconditional positive regard in uh, mediation. Unconditional positive regard in mediation. Welcome, Catherine Oroi. Thank 
Okay. Hello. Uh, well, welcome. You may you may proceed with your presentation. Yeah, please uh, start the video. Can you please start the video for me? Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Gary, can you hear me, please? Yes, please proceed. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Catherine Oroy, we can hear you. Please proceed. Thank you so much. Uh, I've been introduced, and my topic has also been introduced. Uh, it's condition, uh, unconditional positive regard in relation to mediation. Uh, unconditional positive regard, sometimes referred to as UPR, is a term attributed to Carl Rogers. Uh, Rogers is the creator of person-centered counseling and one of the founders of humanistic uh, therapy. UPR refers to accepting and supporting another exactly as they are, without actually evaluating or, or judging them. At the heart of the concept uh, is the belief that every person has the power, has the personal resources within themselves uh, to, help, to help them. If they are not off, if they are not, if they are only offered the environment, if they are only offered the environment to accept, to foster their own recognition of this. Uh, unconditional positive regard, which is uh, UPI in short, regards does not imply one does not have to like someone. Be particularly nice to them or do anything at all for them other than just put your personal opinion to one side and receive them just the way they are. One accepts them, no matter what they say or they do. You see them as a person and actually not a set of behaviors in this way. Yeah. According to Carl Rogers, uh, UPR is about creating an environment for clients that most allows for their health development. This environment benefits the client in several ways uh, as I will outline below. The client feels less fearful and can hear their thoughts, feelings, and actions clearly when they feel not judged due to their position in a matter at hand. The therapist allows the client to uh, space to think for themselves of using questions designed to receive certain answers. Around the client such space, the client can begin to cultivate their inner resources because we believe every client has the inner resources and they can be able uh, to solve the issues uh, just given minimal uh, support. Seeing the client through the behaviors, the therapist offers the client a chance to realize they are more than just actually their behaviors. So is it possible for meditators to practice UPI in, in a meditation session? Yeah. Parties come for a meditation session because they are in conflict and want to resolve the matter amicably. And that is actually why they come for mediation. They need to be assured that, that they will be heard without any bias and that the issues will be given the importance it deserves according to their expectations. They come with expectations. When the mediator apply, apply UPR in mediation, they will hold the client in an unjudgmental manner. Regardless of their status, the mediator understands that the people have internal resources and that the mediator holds their issue, their feelings, and their personality in an unjudgmental way. So when parties come for mediation, they usually have fixed, mixed feelings of whether they will be given a chance to be heard and whether their issues will be given consideration. They are keen to observe the gestures. As you all know, when you are doing mediation, they are really looking at what you are doing, how you are behaving, how you, you, know, you are nodding. And uh, actually they even look at the mannerism that the mediator portrays. This one can send so much, so many signals and maybe make a, a client feel that they are not valued, they are not wanted, and maybe they are less of importance at that particular uh, session. To ensure that the mediator 
gains trust for the parties and communicate that the session will be free of bias. It is important that the mediator understands the role UPR plays to ensure that all parties feel valued and, they are, they are, and that their matter is regarded with importance. So in practicing UPR, the mediator is expect, expected to listen without a sound track. This ensures that the mediator thoughts are only focused on what the parties are saying, just as they are saying it, not what uh, the mediator think that they are. So it is important. And conventional positive regard means that he in the person award the wine, and it can be a good ingredient in mediation as it ensures parties are valued and non, I did not judge. Uh, to sum up uh, this presentation, mediation is a concept, the, the mediation concept is achieving a win-win agreement. And whatever the mediator does in that mediation session, the way the mediation session is, is handled, are determines the outcome of that mediation. So it is important, and I feel it is important for all mediators to be able to practice the PR, to be able to learn what the PR is all about, so that it can make uh, mediation uh, shorter. It can make the parties feel. It can make the parties feel. It can make the parties feel wanted. It can make the parties feel uh, hard, and it can make the Will, that their, 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 their issues will be given the utmost uh, care and the utmost, uh, sorry for this, and the utmost uh, consideration that it deserves. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I really enjoyed um, hearing a little bit about that. I. I'm not familiar with the term unconditional positive regard, so it's not, it doesn't come from a place that I, but I, but I understand the concept and how it fits with mediation. Um, and so I think it's, a, I think it's a really good discussion about where one might draw the skills that come from therapy, the skills that one would learn in other places into the mediation. I think you did a really good job of, of connecting it really directly to what that might look like. I'll throw out um, two things that are ideas that occur to me as I'm listening to you and, and take, them, take them or leave them as you like. Um, but one of the things that when I'm listening to you talk about that, um, there's potential to talk about a direct linkage between um, training of mediators and, and bringing in, you know, as part of the training, um, something more explicit than what we do, because depending on where you study it, you usually talk about something that is like that, that relates to impartiality or relates to um, what the model is, but you may want to be like explicit about this is a training component that can be added. Um, but the other piece too is just to the extent you wanna look at things that um, are more, that will be grounded in other kinds of mediation work too, um, there's a lot of work in, that, that is, the language is procedural justice. And so the, that's the kind of studies that are demonstrating where the value of being heard is to clients in mediation. So it might be just another source to kind of pick up and tie in the, as you're doing these things, you know, tons of studies that are demonstrating parties in court cases actually care more about being heard than they care about winning, right? So, but those kinds of things might be just an added little bonus on why this is high value and how it fits into and different people in the mediation world will hear it differently. So just, just a couple thoughts of things you might wanna to look to, but thank really you. enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Caron, uh, for yeah. your input. I'll consider that I'll take it positively. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks. This is uh, this is the golden opportunity, the golden moment. I believe that uh, we have uh, 
all been uh, waiting for and uh, we have all been building up to. And uh, uh, it's quite interesting, as we say, that this is the golden moment because uh, it is the moment that uh, we are able to invite our fellowship co-director, Dr. Sharon Sutherland, to be able to give us her graduation message to us. Um, after giving us the remarks uh, following the presentations, um, those are the those are the articles that have been received from uh, the fellows and uh, the basis and the genesis of the uh, the presentations we have had today. So, um, uh, just a couple of announcements before we are hearing from uh, Dr. Sharon. So, congratulations to uh, all the fellows who have journeyed on this program. Congratulations to all the fellows who have also achieved. Uh, the, making the presentation on the inaugural, their, their own inaugural in Ignatian uh, lecture on conflict transformation. The conversation on conflict transformation is the center of the, con of the fellowship. Uh, in as much as it is uh, within uh, mediation, the focus is on you know, the conflict transformation of your Einstein uh, area. And I believe that's what um, uh, Dr. Sharon was really keep, kept redirecting us, um, uh, redirecting us into. Um, the second part is that, uh, yes, all the fellows on the program will be able to receive their certificates uh, of participation, uh, following participation in this program. And uh, as um, highlighted earlier, that uh, the fellows who have uh, uh, delivered the inaugural lecture with their feature article, they will have an opportunity to opt in to the next uh, level, which will be for uh, the first half of the year uh, 2022 with uh, the fellowship guide to journey towards uh, having uh, being part of um, the journal publication journey. And so that is why we've really just been emphasizing, let's focus on our articles because they help to build um, our, our clarity. They help to build, communi to communicate to the other persons exactly what are we saying so that we can now move on to the next part of the journey. Um, the colleagues who have made presentations or with their blog, um, um, the blog articles, we encourage you. Uh, we have the next one week, even for the colleagues who have the feature articles, for you to make any uh, if, uh, any 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 amendments to it, so that then it can be posted in the mediators uh, chronicles. As we mentioned earlier, the mediators chronicles is you declaring that you are a mediator in Kenya and. We are declaring that by uh, public uh, by a publication, and so the chronicles will be a continuous uh, collection of articles from uh, the mediators uh, through the fellowship. So, if you've uh, submitted your blog article, we encourage you to uh, uh, upgrade to the feature article, and we have this one week to be able to do that. Then the publication can be put together. Um, we have a, a session with. Uh, our fellowship guide, uh, that is Dr. Reverend Dr. Uh, Peter Mbaro, which will be on uh, Saturday, the 11th of December, when he will be uh, speaking to us on peace building. Uh, uh, the conflict transformation conversation is not just for the sake of it, but it's really just um, for the emphasis of who the mediators are peace builders. And uh, we do look forward to yeah, sending more information on that session as uh, uh, it gets uh, put together. So in uh, uh, wrapping on specifically uh, on, on the fellowship, I just wish would wish to reiterate that the program on conflict transformation, it provides intuitive, reflective and cognitive pathways for participants and also fellows to be able to serve their communities, businesses, families and nations that are in dispute. And the goal of this is that we benefit people, benefit the environment and local economies. I believe that these presentations that have been given uh, uh, Dr. Sharon, we have been able to hear benefits to people, benefits to the environment, and also to um, local communities. So with that, I would like to be able to hand over to our, our, our fellowship co-director, uh, Dr. Sharon Sutherland, uh, with uh, great appreciation, and then uh, from there, Mediator Saracher will kindly uh, be able to pick up uh, um, to uh, pick on the uh, conversation to get us uh, on to closing. So, uh, yes, I have a fellowship topic that I have uh, worked on and I have built on. Um, and my focus is on decentralized dispute resolution uh, for Africa. The focus is on uh, our ODR as a platform in development of mediation service centers um, through community-owned community networks. 
community networks are communities coming together and being able to set up their own internet connectivity. So the goal of the or the outcome of uh, the paper that I, I, I have uh, uh, built on and I will be building on is looking at how we can be able to have the community networks, in other words, communities themselves taking ownership so that they can be able to have uh, access to internet, which is fast, um, affordable, and sustainable. In looking at uh, the topic, uh, I speak on it uh, from the angle of decentralized dispute resolution, that we have ODR and we have ADR as conversations that have been there. And in uh, this particular journey or uh, through the fellowship, I am, I am now introducing DDR, decentralized dispute resolution, and specifically from the angle of communities being able to uh, set up their own internet connectivity so that they can plug in and they are not left out when it comes to the new, uh, uh, the new world order that now we are in. What this means is that then it will enable the communities to be able to access mediators from anywhere in the world. It also means that when we speak about uh, the, uh, the aspects of access to justice, communities will have taken ownership and they will have taken responsibility themselves to create the avenues through which they are able to access justice. And that is why the conversation that um, I am building on is ODR as a platform in the development of the mediation service centers, because then as our communities are able to um, have the community networks for access to internet, then mediation service centers can be distributed across regions, across the country, and the communities can be able to access the services through these mediation service centers, which then have access to the internet, and it means that communities can be able to access and reach uh, mediators anywhere in this part of the world. So I thank you, and that is a brief on my uh, presentation topic. So with that, uh, Dr. Sharon Sutherland, and then uh, mediator uh, Sarah Cher kindly. Karibu sana, Dr. Sharon. Okay. Well, I, I am going to be very, very interested, Wangari, as I think you know, in, in hearing much more about where your paper goes to. Um, it is definitely a topic that is interesting, and it's. And I'm just going to say, um, take the moment to say, it's a particular interest to me at this point as we are um, in our own programs trying to see what it means to do this kind of distributed um, dispute resolution in really small communities in British Columbia, which in, we have many cases where you have to drive 11 hours on a logging road to get to a community. And so courts go in once every three months. It's absolutely something that is of interest, that sense of what do you do to try and build that and what does that look like and how does it play out? So I'll be curious as to hear where you're going with yours and how it, how it plays out. Um, but with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to, I'm just gonna say a few words and uh, I always intended to be relatively brief, but I have to say that as I'm looking at the time and it's approaching 3.30 a.m. my time, I am hitting that point of I'm worried that I'm going to start not making much sense as I talk. So I'm going to really focus on, on just um, when I, when I um, was coming today, all I was thinking of was how much, it, how much I wanted to really congratulate everybody on what they've been doing and how much they have brought to this program um, and congratulate all of the fellows for the various, the work that you've done. I feel that even more so having heard where you're at and, type, and the talks you're doing, the ways in which you've evolved from some of the ideas that I heard initially at the beginning to where you're getting to with much more fulsome ideas at this point. Um, I, I, I was contemplating um, just the one thing I, I, I found interesting in thinking about this fellowship. Um, mediation, we don't always talk about it this way, but mediation is a profession that, that I think of as being a, a fairly focused on these odd contrasts and contradictions. 
Um, it's an area where we're very focused and most of us go into it because we like to work with people. We want to, we want to help, we want to engage with people. We often have, have strong connections. Um, and yet often when I'm speaking to mediators and they're, they're talking about their practice, one of the places they go is to talk about how solitary their work is because they don't have the opportunity necessarily to talk to others about what they're doing. Um, they're involved in these intense conversations, they're in with people all the time, but they're in with people who are in conflict and it's not the same people that they're able to then debrief and talk about the process pieces that they're doing, the ways that they're engaged in that process. And so, you can oddly be surrounded by people and engaged with people all day and still not feeling part of a community in the way that um, that that is really important. Um, we were hearing just again about the, the path that you've taken to talk about wellness. It's the importance of of that community in um, maintaining wellness. And so it, it, it's kind of again, it's interesting. We focus as mediators on um, use, utilizing the skills of empathy, we, we focus on our ability to understand and, and we don't always bring that self empathy to the plate. We often actually are quite hard on ourselves. We'll leave mediations thinking, could I have done something better? What else could I have done? And we don't always have that place to be able to debrief um, in order to move ourselves into that path of no, we we did what we could do, and let's think about our own wellness. Wellness, and and I'm going to say the other thing that seems to be a bit of a contradictory thing in the world of mediation, and I hope that this is not as much the case in Kenya as I find that it is in North America, um, and and to greater or lesser extents in different communities. But I've always found it really interesting that there's that mediators work in this world in which we're trying to support collaboration, we're trying to um, support collaborative conversations and the ways in which people can work together. And despite that, it's not uncommon here for us to find really competitive approaches to the practice of mediation, the, a, a real sense of scarcity that if, if I share any information with this new mediator, that they will then take all the work and suddenly I will lose it all because there's this sense of a finite amount of work, which is just so odd when the in mediation, we spend all of our time talking about how our goal is to uh, expand the pies. We're trying to help people understand how to actually look beyond these, these really finite resources and, and think much more broadly, but we don't always do it in our own situation. And so, you know, and that's despite the fact that let's just face it, there's, there's so much conflict, we're not going to run out of conflict. What we were hearing today was an extraordinary range of different places where you've identified kinds of conflicts that might, might lend themselves to mediation practices. Um, and, and there's so, so many more than that. But, um, in addition to all of this, you know, I, it's been a really challenging couple of years with COVID, with the ways the pandemic has played out, with other other challenges, with the ways it's impacted people's mental health, um, their resilience and their strength. And if people have been less and less able to take steps to address any of the difficulties, let alone the kinds of, of contradictions that make the mediation practice sometimes challenging. And, and it's thinking about those things that are in play in this practice that leads me to really really want to congratulate this group i want to congratulate all of you because what i see happening here is so extraordinary i i think you've really pulled together in a really extraordinary way to to really try to build community amongst mediators which is probably the most important thing that can possibly happen in terms of being able to actually expand the reach of mediation to share ideas about it um, building those mutual support mechanisms that are coming necessarily out of meeting each other hearing each other talk um, those are so fundamental to being able to do work in this field that can as i say feel very lonely when you're not talking to other mediators and in particular 
I, I really, really appreciate what I see of people here, you know, being here to celebrate each other's other's successes and each other's contributions, the ways in which you do celebrate each other, the ways in which you um, you even just coming here today to listen to each other, to hear what each other is doing um, and to applaud each other for reaching this mile, the milestones that you've reached in terms of the work that you've done under the fellowship. I think it's an extraordinary thing. I have rarely, um, in the many years that I have been practicing as a mediator, I've rarely seen communities that have come together so strongly, and especially over, uh, over an extended period in this way. And I hope that what you've done is create the basis for something that can actually um, continue to support you and continue to support the work. And I'm anticipating seeing an absolutely fantastic upsurge of mediation in all kinds of different spaces in Kenya. And what I do hope the most, and I'm, I'm hoping people will do, I hope to stay connected with each and every one of you. Um, and, and I encourage you to reach out um, to participate in whatever kinds of conferences there might be, um, that I'll see you at those kinds of events, but to reach out personally if there's opportunities or, or if there's chances in which you might want to, you want to, might want to talk to me, you might have things that you want to share. I will be very excited to hear that and I'll be very excited to see your progress. So, so on that note, just congratulations to everybody for a tremendous amount of of work and collegiality throughout the fellowship. And thank you for thank you for involving me. Asante sana uh, Dr. Sharon for your remarks and karibu uh, sana Megita Saratel. Thank you. Um uh, thank you very much. Uh, Everybody, I would just like to read uh, uh, some uh, comments, feedback from Honorable uh, Moses Wangela. Uh, he was with us briefly today. Uh, I wish the presenters had more time per presentation. I like the fact that they, they give, uh, I like the fact that they worked on their topics to make them focused and not merely general. Yes, let them keep the target audience in mind. For those proposing mediation in given areas, it wouldn't reach if they let the audience know the type of mediation they intend to use and why. And he concluded by saying that he's eagerly awaiting to read our articles and papers. So that was from the Honorable Moses uh, Wangela. So um, as, as we conclude, uh, this afternoon, this morning for some of us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for many of us, the fellowship journey has been one of learning and growing in so many ways. Five months looked like a huge mountain, as Haika and Coach Mina Azimio would say. But we have scaled and we are just about to reach the summit. But again, this is not the last mountain. It is the first of our many mountains to climb together. Let us improve our articles, work together as peers, and as Dr. Sharon has said, keep the spirit of community, continuing to practice diligently as mediators and being true ambassadors of mediation in word and in deed. I wish to thank each one of us for making this uh, fellowship a uh, success. And so just to give some very special mentions. Uh, first of all, I would like us to thank each one of us and I'll give each one of us an opportunity to just uh, say out your name and clap for yourself. So Sarah Ater. Yes, it, it is us who have made the fellowship our, our success, being present and being committed and dedicated. I'd also like to thank uh, our coaches and mentors for the depth and the breadth of the content uh, shared. They have educated and enriched us uh, very much. And I would like to mention uh, Alex Nyingi, Gishinga Dirango, 
Patrick Wameo, Morenike Obi Farinde, Kochmaina Azimio, Irene Kitui, and of course, Emily Martin, who helped us a lot with the, the public speaking and the connection that we had with the Northwest Collaborative Futures Conference. I would also like to give a special mention and thank you to our fellowship assessors, uh, William Hagan, and the guest assessor, the Honorable Moses uh, Wanjala. Uh, finally, I would like to thank uh, the fellowship team. Uh, thank you to my colleague, uh, Emerald, who has served together with me as a moderator, uh, the fellowship lead, uh, Wangari Kabiru, the fellowship guide, um, the Reverend Dr. Peter Mbaro, our first uh, fellowship director, uh, Reverend Professor Peter Gishure, and of course, our ceremony director and fellowship co-director, Dr. Sharon Sutherland. And just to mention, uh, Dr. Sharon, that uh, you have been a great inspiration and your commitment just being with us, even as you have mentioned not too long ago that it is 3 a.m., it has been a challenge to many of us. So as, as we conclude, once again, thank you very much for everyone's commitment, for everyone's input, and for everyone's effort. Uh, we shall conclude uh, with the words of the Kenya National Anthem. And as we are finishing, we will uh, recite the last verse of the Kenya National Anthem. Let all with one accord in common bond united, build this our nation together and the glory of Kenya, the fruit of our labor, fill every heart with thanksgiving. Thank you very much and God bless you all.
Hi. Hi, hi, hi.